The Ultimate Fighting Championship touches down in the United Arab Emirates this Saturday for another extended stay at its new Fight Island facility. The five-week Abu Dhabi residency is bookended by pay-per-view events. On October 24th, we are scheduled to see Khabib Nurmagomedov and Justin Gaethje unify the UFC lightweight title. But this weekend, it will be UFC 253 and its title doubleheader as Israel Adesanya defends his middleweight title against Paulo Costa in the main event. While in the co-main event, Dominic Reyes and Jan Blahovich will fight for the light heavyweight title vacated by John Jones earlier this year. To help break down those two title fights, as well as the rest of the scheduled 11 fight card, I have an expert panel with me today. Keith Schillen is executive producer of the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network, a host on the Sherdog Radio Network, including the Schillen and Duffy Show, and a writer for Sherdog.com. How are you doing today, Keith? Dude, I'm doing fantastic, but this card is, you know, the big selling point is the two undefeated guys going at it. Can we just say that, Ben, you are undefeated in these intros since we brought the, you know, the round table back to the Sure Dog Radio Network. You have absolutely slammed these intros. I think it's like two or three and oh now. Like you're joined that group of undefeated fighters. I I certainly appreciate that. Uh, we'll we will see whether uh, I stay undefeated and whether I fare any better than some of the undefeated fighters coming up on this card. Uh, also hosting with us is Jay Petri. Jay is associate editor at SureDog.com, where, among many other things, he brings you numbers crunching and statistical fireworks through his Fight Facts articles, as well as the official SureDog play-by-play for major events. Jay, how are you doing? You know, I'm really glad to be here. Um, please excuse my little head cold that I have going, but I'm rolling with allergies, not something nastier. Um, this, this pay-per-view has a lot going for it. And not a lot going for it. So I am really genuinely interested in the conversation to see if we can really dig in deep to some of these fights. Because there, there's some there's some stuff to chew on, but I'm curious how far we can go. Well, it's, it's interesting that you say that because, as I alluded before the introductions, there are nine other fights on this card outside of those two championship bouts. And UFC 253 offers a bit of everything. Uh, there are prospects as well as grizzled veterans. There are a couple of fighters making their UFC debuts, as well as one who will be making, I believe, his 32nd octagon appearance. The lightest and the heaviest men's weight classes are represented. And in a bit of historical coincidence, the winners from the first and last seasons of the Ultimate Fighter reality television show are both on the card. What UFC 253 does not offer, outside of the main and co-main events, is a whole lot of high-level contenders. And in fact, the bantamweight matchup between Caitlin Vieira and Sajari Eubanks is, I believe, the only other fight on the card featuring two fighters currently ranked in Sherdog's top 15 in their weight class. In light of that, Jay, is it fair or accurate to call UFC 253 a two-fight attraction? And what is your level of anticipation in general for this night of fights? You know, we as 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 um, followers of the sport have kind of noticed that the UFC is trending towards uh, a, a boxing model when it comes to pay-per-view. And then it will so heavily stack the top of the card that the rest of the the, the main card even almost pales in comparison. And that isn't to, to, to slight the other fighters in the card. I mean, Kai Car France is, I think, our number 11 fighter on Sherdog rankings. And I believe the UFC has him in their uh, top 10 as well. Uh, but it's a flyweight. I, I think that kind of points to how the UFC cares about this fight card because historically we know the UFC does not like to promote flyweights and here's a top 10 flyweight fight on the main card, which, which makes you wonder what does the UFC think about these pay-per-views? Um, but the top two fights in the card are so exciting and so interesting to break down that it almost, I, I think there's something that our old sure dog host, uh, TJ DeSantis, did when you say, how much would you pay for the fight card? And you look at the two top title fights and go, oh, man, I could throw down 20 bucks for each of those fights. And then suddenly you go, oh, this is a, a worthwhile pay-per-view after all. So um, I'm excited for it to an extent. And I'm also very happy there are only 11 fights taking place in this card and not 14 right. or 17 or 38. <laughs> Uh, Keith, what do you think outside of those top two fights? Uh, is is there some meat on the bone here? Yeah, I, I think Jay made a really good point about the boxing model that when the UFC thinks they have a 
someone who's a star, they don't have to put that, you know, all star main, you know, main card because the star itself. And usually you get that with like a Conor McGregor or, or maybe the co-main event would be someone that they really were trying to like win over with the crowd. Because Conor or when Ronda Rousey or Brock Lesnar, one of these guys that sell with the casuals, you know, it doesn't matter who's on the co- you know, on the way down. So why waste the other stars then? So I think this is a really big test, particularly for probably for Israel Adesanya, where they're going to see if he can sell with a weaker, you know, undercard. As far as the co-main event, like we're saying, it's a two-fight card. It's a two-fight card in, in the sense of. You know, two title fights, I think, obviously, we're as hardcore as they come, where we're interested in it. But to the casuals of casuals, the ones who watch a couple times, the ones like me and Ben, we've talked about this. Like, I always tell how well a pay-per-view is going to do based on how many of my friends who kind of watch MMA when someone they really notice is in it. And nobody has messaged me about Dominic Reyes versus John Mahomes. And it's kind of ironic considering Dominic Reyes was just against John Jones you know, in my opinion, the greatest fighter of all time, one of the biggest stars in the history of the sport, arguably, in many people's eyes, was the first time someone ever should have got their hand raised against John Jones, and still not talking about him. Like, every, I don't know about you guys, but the only person I've, you know, been asked about is Adesanya versus Costa. So, in my opinion, from the casuals, this is a one fight card. Um, as far as you know, to us. Yeah, there's two that really excite you, the, the main and co-main event. But there's some intriguing matchups, like Jay mentioned about the uh, the flyaway fight. But the third fight down on the pay-per-view, you're not expecting a flyweight title. I'm sorry, a flyweight matchup. And when you do have a flyweight third wave of title, that was like when Demetrius Johnson was defending his title or something like that. So to be just kind of guys... You know, it's not even a title eliminating matchup. It's 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 a little surprising, but there is. We'll get to it. There is some good talent, um, up and coming. Some guys we like that I, I think we'll all agree on. The first fight out of the gates in Abu Dhabi will be a light heavyweight matchup between Kadis Abragimov and Danilo Marquez. Abragimov, the 25 year old Russian, is eight and three overall. That might be a bit deceptive though, because he started his career eight and zero entered the UFC and has now lost three straight, most recently getting beaten up by the debuting Romando Leeds at uh, UFC Fight Night 172 back in July. He is taking on the debuting Danilo Marquez, the 34-year-old Brazilian, is 9-2 and two overall. He has not fought at all since February of 2018 and is now making his uh, UFC debut. Jay, what is your take on this fight? This this fight, to me, it feels like a fight that probably shouldn't be on a pay-per-view card. And that is with no disrespect to the fighters, but it just feels oddly placed. It feels like a, a, a fight night throwaway card to see if there's a possible contender that can serve. Contender is kind of a, a, a strong word for it, but a, a, a roster-worthy fighter of these two to, to, to work with. Uh, Abragamov has not impressed me in his UFC tenure to date, he's kind of a, like a three and a half minute man. And, and if you, and if for some reason he can't, he can't get the finish, uh, and spoiler alert, he has not gotten the finish. <laughs> That's why he's zero and three in those bouts. He's sucking wind, uh, very badly. Uh, his UFC debut against Diane Jung, he had, he won the first round in my eyes, but he was just gassed and that was it. And then he got kind of steamrolled. Ed Herman walked through him and Roman Delize and they had their little, it was a skirmish. It was a wild, sloppy kind of back and forth mess. But at the same time, Marquez is a fighter who you look at and go, how, how is this fighter signed to the UFC? Uh, Marquez, I mean, his last two opponents are against a guy who was 5-4-1. and one, And then the guy who he beat before that was 0-16, so, who fought for a, a promotion appropriately titled Gladiator Combat in Brazil. So um, th- there's... Uh, there's some questions on his level of competition in Marquez, uh, who he's fought down in Brazil to get his nine wins and eight finishes. And and I, I truly don't know if he knew somebody or if it's that he trains in uh, uh, in Damian Maia's jiu-jitsu, one of Damian Maia's gyms, so somebody put in a good word for him. But it, it, it seems like a fight between two fighters that probably won't be on the UFC roster for long and the winner may have a, an opportunity to stick around. But... It's strange for me to say this, but I think 
if Ragamov actually has the slight upper hand in this, as long as he doesn't get taken down early and and and, and gas out, uh, because Marquez will will like to take it there. Um, I see Marquez coming in, maybe even waiting forward to get a takedown, getting clipped, um, and this doesn't end well for him because Bragamov is going to try and swing for the fences until he runs out of gas. So I think this is finally, fourth time may finally be the charm for the Russian, and I think he can finally get his first UFC win here. Excellent. Keith, do you agree or disagree with Mr. Petri? Well, I disagree on the part when he called... uh... Bragging off the three and a half minute man, I thought that was Ben, according to his wife. I thought he was a three and a half minute man. Oh, <laughs> but I'll... Uh, no, I, I actually agreed a lot with what Jay said about like the placement on a pay per view. When you have two guys that I think we all agree it's either very low level UFC or not UFC level at all, usually what happens if we have a guy who's on that, he'll get placed with someone who is intriguing, a a you know, a guy making his UFC debut, UFC debut that we're interested in. For example, I would have thought this would have made more sense not not to us as in like the matchup we want to see, but like the this is definitely something Bellator would do instead of having the two, you know, low level guys face each other and the two prospects in like Kamer and William Knight, if you want to call William Knight at this age, a prospect, but you know, guys, you know, early in the UFC career, what Bellator would have done was match those two guys against one of the two low levels and kind of have, you know, two showcase fights. Now, as far as this fight, as, as we just mentioned, this fight's terrible. It's terrible from a talent sense. Uh, Ibrahimov is a guy that not only is he 0 and 3 UFC, he's lost to also fellow very low level light heavyweights. I mean, Ed Herman's, and I guess he's on a winning streak, but I don't think any of us are getting excited about him. But he is 25 years old, which I like. He's, he does hit hard. He throws wildly. Um, as Jay said, he wastes a lot of energy because of that, and, and he's not going to last long in a fight because of that. Uh, he's a decent wrestler, but he's not spectacular. I mean, he'll grapple in the clinch, and like he'll wear himself out in the clinch, even though he's not getting the takedown. He doesn't have the fight IQ to kind of break away and, and regather. I mean, Ed Herman was battering him in the clinch and he and he was still the one initiating the clinch um as as far as marquez i know he as jay mentioned that he has the uh connection to damian Maya. he also has that uh masters mma connection where he's trained over there he seems like he's trained with everybody um it's really weird to be getting like you said getting a ufc debut after you know, when you're 34 years old and you're on a two and a half year layoff um He's faced extremely low-level guys. He's a pretty unathletic guy. He has a very herky-jerky kind of uh, Keith Jardine style where he's kind of moving just to move and not really setting things up with it. Uh, he, I guess they're feints, uh, but I don't see much. I watched him. His chin is very questionable. I mean, I seen him get knocked out in the first round to a guy who had a 6-6 six and six record on the regional scene, which right away was like, ooh, I'm not feeling good about that. I guess he is, you know, he's a Brazilian just a black belt. So if he gets the fight to the ground, he could be a, a submission threat. But say what you want about Ibrahimov, he still did well to like not getting taken down by Ed Herman, other than you know late in the fight. So and Ed Herman, I still think is probably a better wrestler than Marquez. So I'm gonna take Ibrahimov. Uh, like like Jay said, he's probably gonna have to win early to win. So I'll say he does. I'm gonna say he gets a knockout. And I'll say he gets in the first round and, and saves his job. All right. Well, we have a little bit of dissension right out the gate. Uh, I am actually taking Marquez in this one. And believe me, it's not because I have done some level of in-depth study that, you know, gives me some secret key of knowledge that you guys don't have. It's just that in as little as there is out there on him and as much of an unknown quantity as he is, and even if there was a huge tape library, the guy hasn't fought in two and a half years. Uh Kairos Ibrahimov is just not a good fighter. He just does not have any high-level skills at all. Even the things that he came into the UFC advertised as being good at. He was advertised as being, well, this is going to be a a Russian guy who's a great wrestler who hits really hard. Just kind of your classic Russian wrestle boxer, heavy on the wrestle. But he's really not that. You look at him, even when he was killing people on the regionals, he did it by being stronger and more athletic and just Hulk smashing people and throwing them around with really energy inefficient techniques. And as you pointed out, uh, Keith, wasting energy in the clinch, even when he's not doing much. So basically his way to win this is to smash Marquez 
in the first half of the first round. And if he doesn't, unless Marquez is just a complete non-factor, he's going to come back and either win two rounds or, or stop him. Even as an unknown quantity, I feel comfortable betting on that. So give me Marquez by late stoppage. Next up on the prelims, we have heavyweights taking the octagon as the ultimate fighter five bazillion winner. Uh, Juan Espino finally makes his proper UFC debut after winning the series, and he takes on strong style fight team product Jeff Hughes. Espino is 39. A hat tip to Sherdog uh, preview writer Tom Feely for pointing out that even though Espino is the winner of the last ultimate fighter season, and Diego Sanchez is winner of the first, Espino is actually older. He is 9-1 and one overall, and this is his first fight since uh, winning the series by beating Justin Frazier last year. He's taking on the veteran Jeff Hughes. Hughes is 10-3 and three overall. He is 0-2 with one no contest since making his uh, UFC debut uh, through Dana White's Contender Series. It's worth pointing out that he's 0-2 with one no contest, and the no contest was due to him jabbing Todd Duffy in the eye in a fight in, uh, in which otherwise he was getting the worst of it. So it's not as though he's 0-2 with one no contest, but he was really, really winning that other fight. Having said that, and I don't mean to poison the well, but just throw out that piece of historical information, Keith, uh, what is your take on this heavyweight clash? Well, so I'm extremely long-winded if i break down every fight as long as i just did in the last one uh we might be here for like six hours so i i picked out three fights that i'm going to try to be extremely brief on they're the ones i did the least amount of tape study and this is one of them and the reason why i did is uh i did too much tape study on jeff Hughes for contender series and i just don't want to watch him anymore uh <laughs> i'm not imp- i'm not impressed with him he's ext- he's extremely boring um he reminds me of Tim Sylvia, as in like he's big and lumbering. But if Tim Sylvia was less athletic, less powerful, didn't know how to use range, but then like occasionally threw in a spinning move that never lands. Um, and a Spino, oh, and, and, and like throws jabs just in the middle of the air. Uh, Aspino, like we said, we haven't seen him in, in forever, but what we did see was still better than what I've ever seen out of Jeff Hughes. Uh, he doesn't have much on the feet. He'll throw a couple leg kicks, um, you you know, your basic boxing, but his boxing is just distraction so he can make entries into the clinch and it's takedowns. Now Hughes to his credit has done pretty well at stuff and takedowns. So I expect this fight to be kind of boring where um, Espino is going to be pressing him against the cage, and I think he, you know he'll be doing that. You know when they try to reach the the leg around the back of the you know the other opponent's leg and pull it out while you you know they're doing it with the you know they call it the tilt where you're kind of pulling hard down on one side while tilting the other side or or kind of like the the knee drag with I mean um, knee, knee pick without uh, attacking the knee actually attacking the ankle. I think he'll eventually probably get a takedown in each round. Um, I think Hughes would be tough enough to not get submitted, and it would be a really boring fight that uh, the three people in attendance will boo. So uh, give me Espino by decision. I also have Espino in this one. Uh, I have him a little more emphatically than that. There's always a question what a guy is going to look like when he hasn't fought in you know over a year, I believe it must be at this point, and he's closing in on 40. But unless he's seriously diminished by the passage of time— I expect uh, Juan Espino to be bigger, stronger, faster, and more coordinated than Jeff Hughes. I mean, I thought that Keith calling me the three-and-a-half-minute man in the bedroom was going to be the worst shade thrown on this program until I heard if Tim Sylvia was less athletic come out of his mouth. So with that savagery out of the way, how can I not call this a first-round submission win for Juan Espino? I think he will find some way to get Hughes onto the ground uh, unfortunately for Hughes, he kind of uses the clinch as his safe spot when he doesn't like what's going on, even if he's not going to throw much offense from there. It will not be a safe spot for him. I think Espino will find a way to get into the ground. He has some nifty little trips and throws from the clinch or may just be strong enough to just put a body lock on him and kind of throw them both over the side. Once they're there, 
give me another like straight arm lock Kimura, you know, big, big man submission, maybe an arm triangle first round. Jay, is there any dissension here? There is no dissension here. I, I love the idea of the big man submission because that's kind of exactly how I see this fight and several others uh, like it playing out. I mean, let's not forget, sure, it was two years ago, um, Espino hurt his hand. When, when he was injured and out for so long, uh, he had multiple hand surgeries. He didn't have knee surgeries or something that you think a wrestler would have to do with. So I believe that, you know, barring something unusual or that cliff, now heavyweights can fight until they're 50 years old and, and then still kind of be cruising. So, you know, Espino is kind of in the median age range of the UFC division right now, uh, heavyweight division right now. I mean, it took... I'd say about 15 seconds for Espino to pick up Justin Frazier and, you know, pick, pick, pick up Justin Frazier, big meaty 260, 265 Justin Frazier, pick him up and slam him down. Um, I think Frazier actually somehow got back up, but it didn't, didn't make it for long. Uh, it, it's, it's the kind of wrestling that is very frustrating for heavyweights because it could mean either a really terrible slug or a big man submission. And in this instance, I mean, Jeff Hughes, I've, I've enjoyed him and his fights in the LFA to an extent. And then at about the 10 minute mark, I go, okay, all right, let's get the show on the road. Cut to another 15 minutes to get a five round decision multiple times. Um, he, he has always appeared to me to be more of a sprawling brawler who will be a little too complacent on the cage. Um, and Maurice, the Maurice Green fight comes to mind, but it's not, it's not the kind of fight that I think he wants uh, to, to, to get in because Espino is going to close the distance. He's going to charge forward. He's going to grab hold of him, pick him up, do whatever he wants. I mean, we've seen this in, in Espino for his grappling in, in, in tough uh, in the finale. And he's also a, a practitioner and, and I guess the word is champion, I think, um, in the Senegalese Lam wrestling. Uh, and he is terrifying unbelievably strong comically like you've seen Rug Rug, uh, that the same build of the same kind of uh, style that they would practice in those pits. And I saw him absolutely ragdoll larger men, stronger men. So I think that Espino is going to get this fight to the ground PDQ and, and kind of wiggle his way over to, uh, you know, grab a Kimura or like a Cole Conrad Americana and just kind of go, okay, all right, let's go home. So I, I feel like this is getting out of there real quick. See, you, you get, the, you get the idea of the big man submission. Oh, like what is the submission I can get without not laying across your body? Yeah. I've got an arm triangle, Kimura, like far side, straight arm Absolutely. lock. That, yeah, yeah. The big man submission. They work when both right. men are tired oh, that, yeah. you know, yeah. It's just the old <laughs> headlock that Mark Coleman put on Dan yep. Severn. Yep. <laughs> The, 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 head and, yeah. the head and arm choke on your back when when <laughs> when John Volante is sitting on top of you the head, the big man choke. Oh. We march on in the light heavyweight division as the undefeated Alexa Kamor takes on William Knight, who is making his UFC debut. Kamor, uh, and is it Kamor or Kamer? I, I've heard a couple different things. We're probably going to hear both by the end of the night from the booth. I'm pretty sure that, that Anik will say one thing and then Cruz or Cormier will say the other. So, yes. Well, yes, it is. Luckily, we have Anik on this one since it is a numbered pay-per-view and he actually asks the fighters and has a little cheat sheet based on how they say it. I mean, he was the first person outside of Poland to say Ioana Janjacek correctly, and he's been my man for this ever since. Uh, having said that, uh, Kamor comes in. 6-0. and oh. He is another strong style fight team uh, export. As the record might indicate, he hasn't been doing this that long. He made his professional debut, in fact, just barely three years ago. He came in through Dana White's Contender Series last summer, then made his proper UFC debut earlier this year, uh, winning a unanimous decision over Justin Ledet. He takes on William Knight, who is striking while the iron is hot, as many fighters have during this uh, this current era in the UFC when they are often looking for fighters on short notice. He took out uh, Mr. Amanda Bobby Cooper, uh, Cody Brundage, at Dana White's Contender Series in brutal fashion just a couple weeks ago on September 1st. Just smashed him out of there in half a round. 
he is making the short notice turnaround and hopping on a flight to Abu Dhabi. Well, actually, I assume he's there already since we're recording this on Thursday night. Uh, Knight is 8-1. and one. He is 32 years old, and he's actually been doing this professionally even a shorter time than his opponents as he made his professional debut in May of 2018. Jay Petri, who do you have in this matchup of young, at least young in the game, light heavyweight prospects? I, you know, I, I talk about this sometimes on our separate show called Unleashed, that there are those kind of rock'em, sock'em robot, you know, slap down, drag out, messy brawls that I feel like we as as hardcore fight fans almost need every now and then. It's kind of a palate cleanser. Because sure, I can see technical dominance. I can see Espino doing styling on, on Hughes like that. But then every now and then, okay, it's two guys who, let's face it, we know what's going to happen. I mean, they're, well, let, let's see, 14 wins combined, uh, 13 knockouts. I believe most of them in the first round. And Knight's only loss, oh, that's right, it was a first round knockout. Sign me up. I, I, I believe uh, Kamer's debut, he went out of the first round or the second round for the first time, and he looked good. And that was a big question mark because people thought that all of his uh, wins were by, you know, knockout in less than nine minutes. Uh, and his flying knee in, in the Contender Series had punched his ticket. You know, people wondered, could he have kept up that style, that pace? Who knows? Well, he did. Against Justin Ledet, who, you know, the, the the win might not have aged as well because Ledet has kind of been on a slide. But it was still a good performance because he mixed it up. He attacked the body. He even got hurt. Justin Ledet stung him a few times. And that, I think, was actually more important than being able to impose his will and pick up a decision is that Justin Ledet cracked him. And, that, and he was able to, to kind of shake out the cobwebs and go, okay, I'm going to fight. Let's go. And in the meantime, William Knight is that guy. He's going to walk forward. He's going to try and knock your block off. And if you pin him against the fence, he's going to Travis Brown you. And, and this is what he did to get in the UFC when Cody Brundage tried to take him down. Um, Knight uh, got hurt early in the fight by Brundage, got taken down, almost got pounded out. Knight stuffed a takedown against the fence and just slammed down a bunch of those Brown Barnett elbows and then finished the fight. Just, just sheer strength and power. And... We, he, we, he showed that he can survive an onslaught and come back to hurt the other guy. But we've seen William Knight hurt and have to recover. We have seen Kamer get hurt and not have to worry about recovering and just be fine and keep rolling with it. Uh, I think that Kamer is going to get his chin tested early because Knight's going to come out of swinging. Uh, but I think that Kamer so far is the more complete fighter, at least from what we've seen in their performances and the fact that he's, you know done you know he's beaten the ufc caliber guy um i think that camera can survive the adrenaline dump from night and 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 get the win i'm thinking oh, maybe like a second round knockout for camera uh get through some get through some really bad stretches get dinged up and and make it through the end and, and get a finish i think great thank you keith are you feeling the same way as jay is on this one um uh, so uh, let me talk about william knight for a second so I don't know how far William Knight is going to go in the UFC, but he's always going to be a legend in my eyes, and I'll tell you why. I saw him at a reality fighting show as an amateur. He was fighting fellow UFC heavyweight Jorgen DeCastro and for the amateur heavyweight title at the time. And he's the first fighter in history that I, I recall that when the round end, instead of going back to his corner and listening to his corner man, he was breakdancing for that full minute, doing backflips and splits, and like entertaining the crowd well, <laughs> and still won the fight. So um, he told me in an interview that he got in trouble for doing that. But uh, for those uh, <laughs> for that night, that was incredible. Uh, so like I said, he's a former heavyweight, which is pretty incredible considering he's five foot ten. Um, but he, as the commentators say, he's just muscle on top of muscle. And if you see him in person, it's even more impressive. Um, obviously, he has just his raw talent, uh, raw power, I should say. Um Striking wise, boxing wise, I think he's kind of slow and a little telegraphed. Uh, though he does have some like thunderous leg kicks, um, but he throws them like naked without standing up, which leaves them open for a counter. Defensively, he lacks head movement. He kind of pulls his head straight back. Always, you know, being a short guy, he struggles from distance. But he tries to make up by that by just basically just bull rush into the clinch. 
Uh, he's a decent wrestler, but you know he's not a high level wrestler. Uh, I've actually seen him get out muscled in the clinch, which is really surprising when you see his physique. He tries. He, he he's had hit a lateral drop on some low level guys, which I hope he doesn't try in the UFC because usually when you go for a lateral drop, all you do is put yourself put put yourself on your back and let your person be on uh, side mount. If he does end up on top, it is a it's got to be the scariest nightmare in the world because he he is probably our MMA's equivalent to the Incredible Hulk. Like he's just huge muscles and big hands, and he will just kind of like Hulk smash his opponent into oblivion. Uh, he does have some a few submissions on his record as an amateur, so he is a little bit of a threat. If he's on his back, he struggles to get off the of bottom, and car- cardio hasn't been an issue. And, and the fact that like he, he he you know he completely gives up in the third, but when you look at him and, and you look at the history of guys that carry that much muscle, like I'm expecting it eventually to be an issue. That said, he has incredible heart. Like he's found, like Jay said, he finds ways to come back. Like it seemed like fight after fight, he finds a way to to rally back. I've seen him do it at CS regional scene, losing to like a low level guy and rally back. Obviously, we saw the contender series uh, twice now. Our uh, Kamar. Uh, as Jay pointed out, he's very aggressive. He throws hard. I like that he really he sits on his punches. Uh, you know, five out of his of his six wins by knockout. He's got a stinging jab. He does well to bob and you know, he's not he's not the biggest guy. He's actually probably a little small for light heavyweight too. So he bobs and weaves to kind of get into the pocket where he can unload his shots. I love that he rips the body, which you don't see from a young fighter. Uh, he throws. Uh, he likes the high kick. He throws it a lot. He does both like a switch kick high kick, and he throws like a question mark high kick. So he kind of come in on from both sides with a high kick. Uh, he doesn't check leg kicks, which which is uh, which could be an issue, especially against someone like William Knight. Uh, he gets some takedowns from the clinch, but similar to the Knight, he's you know he's not a powerful wrestler. He has been taken down by lower level competition. He's got some good ground and pound. So like this is a very uh, evenly matched fight. I am going to take Kamer. He's the younger fighter. He's more polished. Um, and if he can keep himself out of position where, as Jay says, doesn't put him in a position where Knight can kind of club him, I think he can outpoint him from range. So give me Kamer. And I think, you know what, I said that I'm worried about the cardio of Knight just be from his physique. I think this might be the time it, it, it fails him. I think he might completely be gassed out from the pressure from Kmar, and I think Kmar will get a third-round TKO because of it. Excellent. I, For one, I would never put money on this fight. There's just no way. There, there, <laughs> there, there's just too high a chance that whatever you pick, it's going to end up making you, you feel stupid. I would feel that this was a much more closely matched thing, except for one factor, because... Both of these guys are guys that really, they need more seasoning before we even know what kind of fighters they're going to be. Uh, but in in the case of Knight, he already he's so incredibly yoked. He looks like a guy that ha- probably has a bit of a cut to to make two hundred five, even though he's only like five ten. He's a guy with a whole lot of muscle that needs oxygen, but the fact that he's going to have to make two hundred five again just, you know, three and a half weeks later does give me pause. If he was doing this off of Dana White's Contender Series on like a regular three-month camp, I might almost call this a pick just because each guy is so capable of putting the other way in the first round. But here, I mean, each guy is still capable of putting the other way in the first round, but if that doesn't happen, the passage of time definitely favors Kamer. So I'm going to go with uh, Kamer by... I'm just going to say a clear-cut decision, although him stopping him late if he just gets completely exhausted is not out of the realm of possibility either. The prelim card marches on with featherweights as Shane Young, the first of several city kickboxing products on this card, takes on the debuting uh, Ludovic Klein. Young is 13-4, and 2-1 uh, and one in the UFC, 7-1 and one overall in his last eight, with the only loss coming to current UFC featherweight champ Alex Volkanovsky. So that is not too bad a run for him. He is 27 years old. The debuting Klein, uh, whom I am told is the first Slovakian fighter in the UFC. So that's you know one more off the, the little uh, bingo card there. He is 25 years old. He is 16-2 and two overall. Uh, he is making his UFC debut on fairly short notice but he is coming into the octagon on a seven-fight winning streak. Keith Schillen, who takes this 
featherweight matchup? Ooh, that's a good question because I think this is one of the toughest fights to predict. Uh, before I break down the fighters, I wrote a note down, so I want to make sure I do this. Shout out to my boys, Craig and Matt Allen of Fight Night Picks. Craig has been on this uh, network many, many times. And also, make sure you go over to YouTube and check out their previews for all the cards. Uh, you can search Fight Night Picks. I was watching their preview uh, today, and I love what Matt said and when he was talking about Shane Young. And he said, it's hard to know, w- you know what Shane Young is because he's lost to Alex Volkanovsky and his wins are against Rolando Dye and Austin Arnett. So he's somewhere between... Rolando Dye and Austin Arnett and Alex Volkanovsky. So I think that was a really like kind of you know, funny, funny way to put it. So he's somewhere in that. Uh, I, I like Shane Young. I mean, he's got the, the thing when I when I see Shane Young, the first thing that jumps out to me is just his absolute insane output. Uh, he has just relentless pressure, but it's 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 a controlled pressure. Like it's not wild. Like he, he his pressure is a strategy. And he knows how to use it. Uh, he works behind a jab. He just touches with it uh, to score points, to distract, to find range, everything that a jab is supposed to be. But then when an opening presents, that's when he'll sit on his punch, attack with a nice combination, uh, especially when he gets into his range where he wants, you know, the pocket where he really likes to attack. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of power. Um, he's more accumulative a, a is how he kind of uh, hurts people. What I do like is that he constantly, his combos, he's mixing up between high and low to the body, to the head, to the body, to the head, to a leg kick. Uh, defensively, good head movement, though he does get hit a lot due to his style because he's willing to, you know, eat a punch to land a punch of his own. He's a, he's a decent offensive wrestler, but not the best defensive wrestler, which probably shouldn't matter against Klein. Uh, Klein making his UFC debut. I like this kid striking. Uh, he's very athletic, uh, southpaw. He stays very light on his feet. Um, similar to what I just said about Young, he uses a lot of north-south feints. Where so so, um, he he does like a lot of up and down feints where you don't know he's going to attack high or low. Uh, good jab, good power. Really steps in when he's committing on a power shot, but doesn't really overthrow him. He attacks the body. Powerful leg kicks, but really what jumps out to me is his head kicks. They're quick, and they are just awesome. Like, he will put you out with it. Um, A lot of people have said that they think that Young will have a big advantage in the wrestling. And he, I do think he will have an advantage, but I don't think Klein's defensive wrestling is as bad as it seen. And if you, the, the more recent you see of his film... You can see improvements of this guy who, you know, comes from a kickboxing boxing background. Uh, this fight is awesome. I, I expect it to be a war. This is probably the prelim fight that I'm looking forward to most. I am worried about Klein being able to keep up with Young's uh, insane pace, especially because he's taking the fight on short notice, which makes me a little more worrisome. But if he can, I think he's the cleanest striker. I think he has the bigger power, and I think he might have the higher ceiling. Though we don't know where Young is, somewhere between Rolando Dye and Alex Velkonowski. I think he might be closer to Velkonowski than, than Young is. Uh, so give me the newcomer. I think it's going to be a war, a uh, bloody war. I'll take the newcomer by decision. Great. Jay, how do you feel about this one? Yeah, I'm excited about this fight, too. I think this has um, the potential. I, I, I First of all, I think this is going to go all, all three rounds. Um, I think that the, both these guys can keep the pace. Uh, and, and make it an exciting striking uh, affair. And it's funny. I For SureDog.com, I wrote the news piece announcing that Ludovic Klein was being signed with the UFC, so I did some research on the guy, and I still know very little about him in terms of where he stands as, as a fighter because the tough thing about Eastern European in, uh, organizations is you don't know the level of competition. You can see he can knock out a 13-1 guy, but is he a 13 to 1 guy that you know there's there's 13 to 1 then there's 13 to 1 and, and and I think that his opponents were the you know kind of work their way up maybe had some favorable matchmaking kind of work their work through and and built a favorable nice clean record uh and got clipped along the way um from his style I see parallels to Nikita Krylov which is odd to say because you know Krylov I love is such a offense first attacker. Um, but I like, I really like Klein's head kicks. Um, that, that Schilling, you're right on the money. They're quick, 
they do some damage, and he's not afraid to, to lump up guys with them. Um, Klein's best win is Lucas Tajewski, uh, who is a UFC uh, ex, expat, I believe. He he left the UFC, and he got head, head kicked uh, in February, actually. So that's Klein's last win. But Klein's taking this on really short notice. And on the other hand, I don't know... Of all the city kickboxing guys, I have the biggest question mark of, of of names of Shane Young, because not just is there which place is he, but his wins are against guys with a combined record of two and seven in the UFC. So we don't know that. And Young has been away for a long time—a year and a half for a twenty-seven-year-old is an is an eternity. So and and his and his he's been relatively inactive. One fight in twenty eighteen, one fight in twenty nineteen. And yeah, he's been away for almost uh, 18 months now. And that that's a long, long way off for, for a fighter who is still trying to develop. Um, I like him because of his volume. I like him because of his pace. I think he's going to be, Young is going to be prepared for this fight, whereas Klein will be prepared for the first round and change. And then the, the pace and the volume and the, you know, Young's willingness to eat one to land two or three uh, you know, almost in line with like a Frankie Edgar. I'll I'll get in there. I'll take a couple shots so I can get three off on you. I think that Young's pace is going to be the difference maker. I think that's going to make Klein kind of tuck her out. And I think that Young will be able to take probably the second and third rounds through decision. Excellent. I've gone back and forth on this one as well, just because both guys are fairly unknown quantities. Obviously, Klein is going to be coming from the the promotions that he's coming from and on such relatively short notice, a guy that has fought at 145 as well as 155 fighting at 145 on short notice. But as you point out, Jay, uh, young is about as, I mean, he's, he's about as much a man of mystery as you can be coming from as prominent a camp as he does and having as many UFC fights as he does just because it's been a while since he's fought. The last two people he beat in the UFC are both out of the UFC now. And in the case of Orlando Dye, he's the one who punted him out of the UFC. I can't remember whether he was Arnett's last UFC fight either. But even before that, he came up in promotions in China that have just the spottiest quality. You know, WLF Wars is one that I'm sure Jay is like giving a knowing look at the camera right now. Um, I, I would go with, with Young, except that it has been a year and a half since he's been here. I, I don't normally give shiny new things coming into the UFC the benefit of the doubt. But uh, Ludovic Klein would not have to be that shiny to take two rounds from Shane Young or even blitz him with something early. Give me Klein by decision in this one. Uh, ben, before we move on, can I ask this question? Of course. We we keep saying that Shane Young, like, we don't know what we have with him. And this, he, he looked really good in those two wins. But like we said, we're talking about the two lowest levels of, of the division. Is... Is Shane Young, like, fighting for the title of, like, worst guy in the gym? Like, we don't know. Like, like obviously, <laughs> this, obviously, the city kickboxing, I'm not talking about the guy still fighting on the regional scene or the guy who just started and he, and he, he wants to take an amateur fight six months on. I mean, like, the guys who reach that level, like, it seems like every team has, like, all these, you know, especially the hot teams have all these killers, but then there's always that, like, one guy holding them back. Like, for example, Florida 7 May has been, like, killing it. They've been doing all this great thing. But then they still have Steven Peterson. Like, is Shane Young, could he be that guy for city kickboxing? Uh, he certainly could. <laughs> I, I, I feel yeah. like he's fighting for like if he wins, he, he might not be. He might go to somebody else. But if he loses, he's that guy. Well, he's got to compete against a couple champions, a couple top five guys. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's actually kind of funny. Uh, let's see, we're like almost the entire top echelon of city kickboxing is on this card. I'll, I'll just point out: um, Adesanya, uh, Car France, Shane Young, Brad Burdell. So yeah, this is. This is city kickboxing's time to to shine or, or or you know eat dirt here. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this, and I know we're spending too much time with the Shane Young fight, but I was thinking about city kickboxing. Of all places, I was going to the bathroom. I think of MMA and uh, and the brand the shirt dog breakdown show, and, and I was thinking about city kickboxing. And I was like, this is a team like three years ago we wouldn't even talk about. Now I got to ask the question: Are they the best team in MMA? Like, are they are they number one? If not, they're at least like as as we used to say, like as me and Ben say, they're in the club, you know. Like they might not be, they might not have the best seat in the club, 
But they they got past the bouncer. Like that team is in the club. And there was a time where we would have said like guys from New Zealand and Australia would have to travel to America to get good training. I think soon, if it's not already happening, we might see it the other way. Like people are gonna say, I'm gonna go to City Kickboxing and train with those guys. Some guy from you know Texas going out out there. You know. Oh well, I mean, there's a, there's a time that all three of us remember that it would have been laughable. For someone to say, yeah, all these Americans are like flocking up to Canada to train with like this guy with like an Arab sounding name, you know, just because George St. Pierre ended up there. You, like it happens. It's a good the point. Thing about, thing about city kickboxing is before this just kind of massive explosion in the last few years, even regionally, they did not have the best reputation. They had the reputation as just kind of the generic gym, almost like the, the McDojo of Australia, you know, kind of like. Tiger Shulman's did when they first started uh, training MMA fighters instead of just being like the strip mall karate place. Uh, you know, so it just tell, and it's the same coaches in place. It's been Eugene Behrman the whole time. So it's really, it comes down to the fighters. Like when you get the best fighters or the right fighters for that coach, that's all it takes to change the whole narrative on, on the yeah. team. Yeah. I figured we would talk about the team at least one time, considering they have, I think four fighters on the card. Might as well put it at this car, this fight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't think of many other teams that really stick up there. I mean, I already said it that too, there are two champions in city kickboxing. Uh, Sanford MMA is about the only other one that I can really think that there's the 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 top guys up there. And Gilbert Burns is fighting for a title too. Usman um, is is going to be holding the door, so that's going to be fun. Yeah, I mean, that it's one of those gyms like Fortis MMA in the states that just went, okay, we're here. Let's start doing doing the thing. And uh, I mean, it's funny. This this could be a make or break event for for uh, for city kickboxing. I mean, because they got four guys on the card. What happens if they all lose? That's that's a big hit. Hey, then what, it, what it, happens it, if they all win? Then they look yeah. like yeah, rock yeah. stars. Then they're like, well, damn, this event probably would have been in in Australia if not for COVID. Damn it. If they all win, <laughs> they'll make the they'll make the bulls list. So that's I the, did. Uh, it's funny. I did. I did pitch that. That this is this fight card is kind of figuratively taking place in like Melbourne or something. So this is yeah, this is this is UFC Fight Island in Aus- from a you know what is it a uh, uh, fighting out of Australia? Yes. Along with that same narrative, our next fight up at the prelims is Jake the Celtic Kid Matthews taking on the Ultimate Fighter season one middleweight winner Diego, the second nightmare on this card. Sanchez in a welterweight matchup. Matthews is 26 years old. He is 16 and four. And for those of us that remember just a couple of years ago when he was one of, if not the youngest fighter on the UFC roster and just this incredibly baby faced child, it's hard to believe that he is now nine and four in the UFC. Uh, He's won his last two kind of like we were just saying about his, uh, his buddy Shane Young in the previous fight, his his two wins have been against uh, Emil Webermack and uh, Rostam Akman. So not like the the best of the best on the UFC roster, but nonetheless, he's won two back to back. He is taking on the ageless and ever eccentric Diego Sanchez. Sanchez is 38 years old. He is 30 and 12 overall in his career, 19 and 12 in the UFC. Uh, one of the more prolific uh, fighters in UFC history, uh, a guy that, you know, certainly is on the leaderboard for a lot of career stats in the promotion, indisputably on the tail end of his own career, but nonetheless finds himself uh, in the last two years, roughly three and one in the UFC. Having said that, there is a little bit of smoke and mirrors to that. Uh, the best fighter he fought, Michael Chiesa, pretty well dominated him. His wins are over Craig White, Mickey Gall, and via disqualification for an illegal knee, uh, Michelle Pereira, uh, back at UFC Fight Night 167 in February of this year. In a fight that I'm going to say without even looking and checking myself, has the greatest age disparity of any fight on the card. Uh, how do you feel about this one, Jay? Who takes it? You know, I... I'm I'm really torn right here in this fight. Not don't hold on. Let me let me let me preface that by saying this isn't about to introduce a Diego Sanchez pick, but 
but, but, but. This is to introduce a Diego Sanchez should not be a plus 525 underdog. That that, that Jake Matthews shouldn't be a seven and a half favorite. I, I don't believe that should be the case. And at the same time, it is bizarre to me that the more active fighter in the past few years of 26-year-old Jake Matthews, babyface kid, is <laughs> against, you know, the the original tough guy is Diego Sanchez, and that that is a strange thing to me. Uh, I, I don't understand it. I don't want to understand it because then I get into the mind of Diego Sanchez, and that's a whole can of worms. Um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of analysts expect that that Matthews is going to run through him, uh, and and that's probably fair. But what I've been seeing is analysis that that, that says that Matthews is going to finish him, that they're that he's going to knock him out. Uh, because Sanchez has been chinnier than usual lately, but then you look at the strikes that did the damage. Joe Lozon teed him up, busted him up. Uh, Ally Quinta, of all people, boxed him up. And then, of course, the elbow from Matt Brown. Um, those, those are pretty good knockouts, and then he's been pretty able to keep his head on his shoulders. I mean, Michelle Bejeda was so crazy, he almost kneaded off into the stance, but that's a different story. I don't know if Jake Matthews has the power... Of, of a Matt Brown to, to get a stoppage like that. What I know Jake Matthews to be is that I can do some damage on the feet, but it's to get you down on the ground, to, to, to force a scramble, to take your back, to get a rear naked choke, uh, to, to tie you up or do something like that. I don't see this as, and that's not a good, that's not a game you want to play with Diego Sanchez. Let's not forget that Diego Sanchez has not been submitted and he has faced some fantastic grapplers. Uh, Sanchez against Kiesa, which you mentioned, uh, Kiesa had him in all kinds of trouble. He had his back. He was really close to, to sinking in the rear naked choke about 8, 12, 14 times. Never could get Sanchez. And I don't see uh, just Diego falling off versus Matthews grappling being that much better to get the finish. I, I feel like Matthews can outwork him. Um, he, he can... I mean, he can do whatever he needs to do. He can probably take Diego down. Diego's takedown defense uh, is is spotty, and he has a reluctance to kind of wait on the ground. I don't know if there's a better way to describe it, but he just seems almost complacent on his back. Uh, but at the same time, you know, he still has some of his fire. But look, let's, let's, Diego finally has a corner man, Stefan Bonner. Teammate from Tough Season 1 will be in his corner, so it will not just be Josh Fabia for all of his accolades. I I really <laughs> want to explain. I want a devil's advocate so badly to see a path to Diego Sanchez winning this fight. But seeing his recent performances, especially since changing, leaving Jackson Winklejohn to go to Josh Fabia is, is a pretty elite coaching change, I have to say. I just, I don't, he doesn't have the wrestling he used to. He seems, Diego seems a little more gun shy. It's just, this is a tough fight for him in that it's a 15 minutes, oh, Diego, I wish you would pull the trigger. And that's kind of the situation we find with a lot of fighters that, that, that Ben specifically has uh, scream at the TV fighters. Diego, why won't you take him down? Diego, why won't you do what you used to do? Where's that brawl? Where's the the Gil Melendez, I don't care, I'm just going to punch you until you fall down, or I fall down? That's gone, and what's left is kind of a tentative, I'm not sure exactly what I should be doing, I don't know what to do with my hands, kind of Diego Sanchez, and that's really too bad, because it makes us look and go, man, are you sure you want to keep getting hit in the head, Diego? Things aren't looking great. Uh, so Matthew's by decision, and we'll look at each other and go, man, Diego, what are you doing, buddy? I I don't say this to, to kick somebody while he's down or make too much fun of what was presumably one of the low points in his life. But the last time I saw Stefan Bonner, he was face down in the dirt next to his car while a crowd of people, uh, including a concealed carry private citizen, were basically holding him waiting for the cops to arrive. To add that man to your camp and have people point at it as like a possible return to reason and good sense says a lot about Josh Fabia, doesn't it? Hey, man, you got to have some hey. sort of a silver lining. Yeah. Hey, uh, having said that, I mean, as as depleted as Diego Sanchez obviously is, if there is such a good thing, or I mean, sorry, if there is such a thing as a good style matchup for him, 
in the UFC in 2020, Matthews is kind of it. The things that Matthews does well line up with the last things that Diego Sanchez is good at. And uh, Matthews' best routes to victory kind of line up with the things that it's always been hard to do to Diego Sanchez. Uh, Michael Chiesa completely big brothered the man on the ground for three rounds and couldn't finish him. I mean, he even did the same thing he did to Condit, where he restrained him with one hand like you would expect someone to need two hands to do. Like, just almost got like a hammer lock on him and just had a, an arm completely free. Couldn't finish him. Uh, Sanchez is, uh, this sounds hokey and cheesy to say, but he's a survivor in, in the, the cage. Like, his heart has never, ever, ever been in question. And it's the one thing that's never abandoned him. His uh, cardio has, has never really abandoned him either. I mean, he used to be a complete cardio machine where he, he would just overwhelm people with his pace. But even now, I, I think he looks like he's waiting on the ground a lot just because he, you know, knows the limitations of his tank in a way he does not know the limitations of his chin, perhaps. All of this is not to say that I'm picking him to win this fight. Just that, yeah, I expect Matthews to take all three rounds in pretty lopsided fashion Maybe not a 10-8 because there's just never a round where he really does something where you're like, oh, man, the fight was almost finished there. But uh, Sanchez will survive. And, I mean, we'll probably be talking about him again in three or four months. You know, maybe he'll he'll add, you know, like War Machine to his corner for, for the next fight or something. Who knows? Keith, are Jay and I crazy? Uh, well, Jay asked for someone to argue for Diego Sanchez finding a way that he could win. So I'll do it. Jake Matthews could hit him with an illegal strike and Diego <laughs> Sanchez can ask the referee if he's going to win, if he doesn't keep fighting hey, and then he doesn't fight and he wins. That's a, that's a new weapon in the arsenal. Not many people add a new weapon this late in their career. Yeah. So I, I said there's three fights. I'm going to try to save time on because I think they're the three fights that I think are the biggest blowouts. So this is the second one. Matthews is younger, he's bigger, he's stronger, he's more explosive. I would say Diego's best path of victory, or really his only path of victory, would be a grappling matchup, which I think even the biggest Sanchez backers would say is probably a wash at best. I would still favor Matthews if it was strictly a grappling matchup, but maybe that's his best route. Um, but... As long as on the feet, which is really funny to think Jake Matthews, I'm going to say this about a guy that one time was so one-dimensional, but if it stays on the feet, Jake Matthews is going to, like, a bull like, just just destroy him. Like, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be terrible. So I think Sanchez is washed up. I think he's been washed up for years. I wish he would have retired years ago. I don't think Stefan Bonner is going to change that. If somehow he does... Like, then let's just keep doing, like, a new corner for Diego, like, from old tough guys. Like, I want to see Bobby Southworth and Josh Koscheck be his next corner man. Or maybe, <laughs> like, or maybe have, like, Chris Lieben being drunk with Nate Corey as being, like, his mouthpiece. <laughs> like, you know? Um, so I, I, I agree with you guys saying he's definitely not going to submit Diego Sanchez. He probably won't even stop him because of how insanely tough. But I disagree. I think there is going to be 10-8 rounds. I'm going to go with Matthews. I'm going to say there's going to be like multiple 30-25 scorecards. Like, I think this is going to be terrible. So give me Jake Matthews an absolute blowout. All right. So all three of your panelists have Matthews in that one by unanimous decision. Keith Schillen uh, in more lopsided and uh, definitive fashion. All right. That brings us to the featured prelim of the UFC 253 preliminary card, where we have in an evening of shiny new things in the promotion, arguably city kickboxing's shiniest new thing in the form of the eight and one 28 year old Brad Riddell who takes on Alex Da Silva Coelho. Da Silva Coelho is 24 years old, 21 and two overall. He is one and one in the, the UFC having lost his promotional debut to Alexander Yakovlev by guillotine choke. He then came back in August of last year and beat Rodrigo Vargas by decision this is his first appearance since then, so it has been just a little over a year since he has appeared in the Octagon. Riddell made his UFC debut last October, and he is 2-0 in the promotion. He beat Jamie Malarkey at UFC 243, and then he beat Magomed Mustafaev at UFC 
fight night, Felder versus Hooker this February. Keith Schillen, who takes it in our featured prelim at Lightweight? All right, so this is the last time I'm going to be short. So if you ever hear me after this and you don't want to hear me long-winded, just skip to the next person. So Alex De Silva, I actually like the guy. Like, I think he's pretty well-rounded. I think he's a pretty good athlete, uh, good offensive wrestler, good grappler, uh, pretty technical striker. But everything I said about him, I like Brad Riddell way better. Uh I think he's a better athlete. I think he's more well-rounded. I think he's better at gra- you know, grappling or at least scrambling, his style of scrambling. And I think, obviously, I think he is a way better striker. I think right now we have Adesanya and Volkanovski as the two top spots for uh, city kickboxing with, obviously, Daniel Hooker having spot three. You know, when we talk about uh, overall talent. Like, it wouldn't shock me if a year from now if we're changing our opinions and it's Riddell having that number three spot. Uh, this guy showed great uh, scramble ability against Mustayev. He really uh, has a lot of variety of strikes, whether it's the jab, the cross. I mean, he has all the weapons. El- he stepping elbows. Uh, he attacked the calves. But what I really am most impressed with him is his ability to basically plant his feet, hold his ground, and you if you're like inviting people like go ahead you're going to come in but every single time you come to attack you're going to get hit hard with a combination and then you're going to go what do i do now because every time i go to try to hit him he beats me to the punch and he's way more technical um this guy's really impressive i think he puts out uh de silva i'm going to say in the second round by tko jay do you agree with mr Shillin's take on this fight um, I, I'm on board with with how hyped I am about Brad Riddell. I think that there's a lot for him, and I think why I feel that especially is because of his most recent performance in February, uh, where he stood toe to toe with Magomed Mustafayev, who, which many of us thought was the far superior striker. Um, he he could you know he did he was more flashy, uh, he hit harder. All those things that we expected was the other way around, and that was really interesting to me. Uh, in the very first round, uh, Riddell cracked him and and had Mustafayev on on kind of rubber legs. And then they went back and forth. It was a very interesting um, uh, first round that actually, because of all the craziness that happened, because I believe that Mustafayev had a takedown, it was back and forth. I actually scored the round a 10-10 because it was that well-matched. But then I believe that that Riddell actually uh, took, he took it in the end. Um I, I'm I'm really curious about how he can adapt to a talented grappler like Kohelio because when he was toe to toe with uh, uh, Mustafayev, he actually made Mustafayev shoot in on him, which was a very interesting thing that I did not see coming. Whereas Kohelio is more, much much more interested in, in taking this fight down. Uh, he he ground out and 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 handled Rodrigo Vargas uh, last year uh, by taking it to the ground. But I don't believe in Alex Coelho. And I don't believe in him, not because I don't think he's a good fighter that could develop, but because he's 21-2 with majority of his wins in a promotion in Brazil called Aspera FC, which, unfortunately for Aspera, um, there is a connection to one Astro Fight team, and the fighters that fight out of that camp get favorable matchups. Now, I don't mean favorable matchups like, you know, fighting a 500 fighter, go on, something like that. I mean, he's 11-0 and 0 and fights an 0-4 guy. I mean, the kind of thing where he is a 15-0 and 0 fighter. 15-0, and 0, and he fights a guy that's 6-8. and 8. And this is in the Aspera FC promotion. So I don't want to go so far as to say his record is fabricated, because he did win these fights, and I have seen footage of said wins. The, the level of competition is a manufactured one at, at that. And it's it's similar to to fighters like Giga Chikaze, who fought in Gladiator Challenge in California, fought a bunch of guys with a record of like 1-42 in 42 or something like that. But he was able to develop because he was a good fighter. Can Coelho do that? Sure, absolutely. But I think Riddell is far too skilled in basically every facet of the game. 
Like, I think the only way that Coelho is going to win this fight is if he gets it down, is if he's fishing for a submission, if he maybe catches him dry or something like that, because I don't think he has the power to hurt Riddell, and Riddell's only loss was an early arm bar when he was very dry. I think that that's, that's the path that Coelho can, can win, but I don't see it. I, I see Riddell... I don't know if he's going to finish the fight. I, I'm, I, I'd like to see it because then we can really see, you know, when, when he, when he, go, when Riddell would go for a finishing sequence, how does he prioritize it? Because uh, all of his recent wins have been on the scorecards, Malarkey, Master Five, uh, another guy before that. And I want to see how he tries to finish an opponent that is more tested than a glory of heroes opening fighter. Um, I, I'm I'm really curious to see that because I think he can Riddell can I'm with you, Shillen. I think that that Riddell could be that guy that we go, oh my gosh, we were sleeping on this guy. He's a fringe top ten guy. Where did that come from? And and I'm I'm curious about that. And I think that the Coelho is it's a, he's got a gutty record, and I think he'll find he'll have his first loss at the hands of Riddell. I think Riddell will take it uh, on the scorecards, and he may hurt Coelho along the way. I'm on board with you uh, there, Jay. And I'm glad you brought up the whole uh, Aspera FC thing. I won't go into depth there. And none of this is to say that they're not a legitimate fight promotion. They are. They put on real events. They are a prolific uh, fight organization. But they are definitely a win factory for Astro Fight Team prospects. I mean, on paper, he is the far more experienced fighter, having debuted in Aspera all the way back when he was 17 years old. But if you took his whole record and Riddell's and just threw them all into a bowl and pulled out the 10 best fighters uh, of all the opponents there, more than half of the 10 would be uh, on Riddell's ledger easily. Uh, I think Riddell's going to be a, an unpleasant surprise for Alex Da Silva. Despite him having the nickname Leko, uh, Riddell is the far better kickboxer of the two of them. And where taking things to the ground is Da Silva's kind of safety valve sometimes. I think we're going to see Riddell just be the physically stronger guy once they touch and clinch and, and if they should go to the ground. I think it's going to be a, an unpleasant night for De Silva. I expect him to lose in lopsided fashion. Give me Riddell by a uh, third round finish, either one of those choose your poison finishes where he's hurting him on the ground and it's either stay where you are and get punched out or give your back and get choked out. But Riddell by finish late. And with that, we move over to the pay-per-view main card of UFC 253. And right out of the gate, we have a red-hot matchup between uh, rising featherweight contenders. We have Zubaira Tukhugov versus Hakim Dabudum. Tukhugov, 19-4-1. He is 4-1-1 and in the UFC. Uh, beat Kevin Aguilar in February at UFC fight night, Felder versus hooker had a draw against Leron Murphy before that. And before that he had about a three year layoff during which he was chiefly memorable for showing up in the cage after the Khabib Nurmagomedov versus Conor McGregor fight and appearing to throw a sucker punch at McGregor as he was seated on the ground after his fourth round defeat that got him, I believe a year's worth of suspension tacked on to uh, things that already had him out of the cage. But nonetheless, he's back and has shown himself uh, once again still capable of beating UFC featherweights. Across the cage from him will be Dawudu. Uh, Dawudu, the Canadian, is 11-1-1. He is 4-1 in the UFC. After losing his uh, debut to Danny Henry, he has racked up four straight wins over Austin Arnett, whom we talked about a little earlier, Kyle Bochniak, Yoshinori Horie, and most recently Julio Arce, last november keith who do you have in this featherweight matchup yeah so i i'm really glad that you brought up the mcgregor thing because i think i probably speak for everybody when we see the name uh Zubari took off the first thing we think of is that conor mcgregor attack I mean, you're talking about the biggest fight in ufc history and him jumping the cage and and like you said sucker punching a guy regardless of what conor mcgregor said did whatever like, it is extremely cowardice to not only attack a guy, but to attack a guy from behind. And then not, not only that, but you attack the guy who just fought, you know, almost 20 minutes against arguably the pound for pound best fighter in the world. And you're going to jump in. Like, that was completely cowardly. That said, that doesn't change my opinion of Tukov as a fighter. 
as he's extremely skilled. He's well-rounded uh, on the feet. Uh, nice jab, good power. I like that he like has a lot of variety. He attacks with a lot of different combinations, uh, keep himself very unpredictable. That said, his left hook is his, I think, is his best strike. He kind of whips it at you. Um, he does really good to slip his head just out of range, but then come back with a combination, kind of like um, you know, a little bit of a counter striker that way. Um, defensively, he he does drop his hands, throws from his hips, can be a little wild. Um, so I I don't think he gets the credit for how good of a striker he is. Um, but his bread and butter is his wrestling. He's a very very good wrestler. He does very well at changing directions. Like I love how he gets in the hips and then he cuts the corner really good. Uh, smothering top control, which is what you get from these Russians. Uh, good, good ground and pound. Cardio is a little bit of an issue as we saw him slow down in that Lerone Murphy fight. That said, I think you said that he's four one and one in the UFC. He could easily be six and zero. Oh. Uh, the Moicano fight, I think a lot of people forgot. Like I just rewatched it. That's I forgot that fight was. Ex- I mean, it was a split decision for Moicano. It was extremely close. I did score for Moicano. But I, I would have no issue with anybody giving it to Tukov. And we know how good Mokano is, you know, ranked in the top 10. And then the Lerone Murphy, there is no – I don't know how that was a draw. There's no way Tukov lost that fight. Um, move over to Dawadu. Uh, you know, he's got four wins around. He's a, you know, he's a Muay Thai striker. What really stands out to me is how composed he is. Um, he seems very relaxed. Uh, pressure counter striker, similar to – like I, I always use her example when I talk about a pressure counter striker, similar to a Chris Cyborg, where um, her stalking style is what opens up things for her. Uh, he uses a really high guard, which I like, and um, but the only difference between him and Cyborg is is his pressure. He follows more than he he doesn't cut enough. He needs to really know how to cut off angles. Uh, but he uses feints well, and he throws those calf kicks. Like that's his specialty, and it's a lot of combinations with the calf kicks. Uh, he doesn't check leg kicks, uh, and because he's so offensive mind, he, he's very defensive mind up top, but not so much down low. Um, he also can start a little slow that like he's, you know, he, he's a guy who, you know, he steps on the, on the pedal a lot more as the fight goes on, but that could be an issue because he could easily give away the first round. Um, weak, weak, weak takedown defense. I mean, I've seen him get taken down by Julio Arce and Kyle Bosniak who, you know, neither guy is known for, you know, high level wrestling, especially not to Chukagov's level. Um, that said, he's hard to keep down. He does well to get back to his feet. But he has given up his back to get up to his feet, which is definitely um, disturbing. Probably by the way I'm breaking this down, I like this fight. It's a very intriguing matchup. But I can, I, I, I can tell you, you probably can see that I'm leaning towards Tukagov. I think he's more well-rounded. I actually think he might have the more power on the feet while uh, Dawudu is the, the you know more technically sound. But if he can even just break even on the feet that is a huge like plus for him because he's going to have such an advantage on the ground. I expect him to, uh, you know, do well on the feet, get some takedowns and I could see him actually getting a late stoppage, but I'm going to say took off wins by decision. And this is, and this is one of those ones. Sorry. I, I know I sound like I was done. The odds are extremely close to this one. And I really don't like, this is one of my, like, I feel very confident about this pick. Like I think took off wins, um, not feel easy. I just, I would be surprised if Dowdy wins. Like if I I'm not a gambling guy, but I know like I know Jay is Jay puts the prime picks out there. If I wrote that that article, um, this is one that I would suggest. All right, and it was close to a pick'em uh, a week ago. Uh, Tukugov is just creeping a little more into the minus money, and you can actually finally get that would do it plus money now, like you know plus one hundred five, plus one ten some places. So uh, the public, at least the wagering public is kind of feeling you on this one as am I. And I think I said this uh, on my other show earlier this week, but this is an indication of how deep the featherweight division is worldwide, as well as in the UFC. I mean, if I took the heavyweight division or say the women's bantamweight division, and I said, we're going to have a fight between two fighters who are not in the top 15 and probably you wouldn't even make a really strong argument for the winner to be in the top 15. Think about the quality fight you'd be getting at heavyweight or at women's, ba- women's bantamweight. And then look at these two guys. These are two very good fighters with uh, plus skills in at least most of the main 
uh, you know, MMA skill sets. And while we've talked about, you know, their limitations and, and their quirks, we're talking about minor things. We're, like, we're not saying about either of these guys, oh, yeah, if this goes past two minutes, it's all over. They're, they're going to be dead. Or if it goes to the ground, they're completely toast. So just an indication of how fantastic Featherweight is. And I feel Tukugov on this one, even though he'll have to kind of thread a needle to do it. Um, he's not a terribly fast starter. And of the two of them, his gas tank is probably more of a question. Like Dabudu, he's an incredibly just smooth, fast twitch athlete, fast of hand and foot. But he doesn't have a hyperactive work rate. He tends to kind of look very smooth and graceful and almost like he's moving slow out there until he decides to zap somebody with one of those kicks that just blasts right out there, you know, or, or throws a straight or a cross. But uh, I, I just I expect Tukugov to win uh, two of the three rounds, probably the first and second, maybe the second and third. Uh, and yeah, just to, to take a, a clear cut decision in this one, I, I think he his his wrestling will be the difference, and I don't think Dawudu will be able to do enough things on the feet to sway the judges into giving him two rounds. Having said that, Tukugov has been part of a split draw where one fighter gave the fight to him, one to the other guy, and one scored it a draw. So there's something about this man that confuses observers, so who knows what we get. But uh, for the time being, uh, give me Tukugov by unanimous decision. Jay, is there going to be dissension in the ranks? There's going to be dissension in the ranks, boys, and I am very excited about this. Actually, if I'm actually not writing about this fight on Prime Picks, I did consider it, but I'm kind of licking, licking my wounds after last week's underdog, the the full underdog play that didn't quite pan out, so we're going to stick to a little little safer territory this week. I like Dawadu. I like him in this fight, and I like him because of his striking, his volume, uh, and his accuracy. Now, this is all. This could all be for not in the first ah sixty seconds, maybe ninety seconds, because if Tukagov can hit the takedown, if you can hit the first or first or second one, um, then you know it, you're going to be in trouble most likely. Um, but yeah, and you mentioned Keith that that uh, Dawudu's gotten take. He's been taken down by Julio Arce and Kyle Bochniak. He's been taken down three times in in twenty attempts against him. So it wasn't just an at will takedown. It was Kyle Bochniak tried a dozen times and got him a couple. But you nail it in that Dawudu doesn't stay down for long. That you can, if you can, if you can manage to put him on his back, good luck keeping him there. And I think that ability to to spring up after a takedown. Um, I think no more uh, a bigger indication of that than Abel Trujillo when he fought Khabib Nurmagomedov. Got taken down 20 t 21 times, and he still managed to get back to his feet. I mean, granted, Khabib took him back down, but Khabib is a far more accomplished wrestler than Tukugov, despite you know the, the parallels some people can draw with him. I would not be surprised if Tukugov gets the gets the fight to the ground um, and 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 tries to control him there, but Dawudu. His his only big loss that I remember is one that absolutely sticks in my head, and it kind of kind of made me question this pick because uh, he in his UFC debut uh, he walked up to da Danny Henry and he he just kind of walked forward, got slugged in the face, he got hit with a, a big right hand, and then kind of fell into a guillotine choke, and it was all over, and it was you know a thirty second thing, and he was put to sleep. I don't know if Dawudu was gonna walk wade forward like that um i I'm, i i kind of see him stocking tukugov down and and stuffing the takedowns that are going to kind of come at him and what i'm expecting is that if dawadu stuffs a couple um that tukugov will kind of sell out and come from a further distance away and kind of go for you know more telegraph takedowns and i can see that dawadu getting the advantage with that um i i i really do like his work rate, Dawadu's. I, I like that he can keep it going for, for three rounds, um, mix in strikes, get late finishes, which is a very important thing. He's got multiple uh, third round finishes on his on his ledger. Uh, I, I like what he has to bring to the table. I, I love the idea that this is a a main card opener that is an action fight. There, some fun thing is going to happen. Now, granted, Tukugov could grind this fight out, and we'd be very disappointed. But I don't think it's going to happen just in terms of an excitement standpoint, not a pick standpoint. Um, I think Dawadu is going to get through the worst of it 
and and be able to to handle the rest of it. So he if he drops the first round, he's not going to drop the second and the third round. So I think that Davidu can outlast him and win a decision by volume and numbers because Tukov, for all of his takedown credit, doesn't really land a lot of strikes. His the most amount of significant strikes he's ever landed was in the UFC was forty strikes. That's not a crazy amount. Um, and and Davidu you know doubles that up, triples that. So I, I feel like if this fight goes down in the first 60 seconds, then Dabadu is in trouble. But as long as he can keep it on the feet, I see him cruising to a, a, a good, fun, spirited decision. Next up is the only women's fight on the UFC 253 card as Caitlin Vieira and Sajari Eubanks lock it up at 135 pounds. Eubanks is 35 years old, 6-4 and four overall, has had kind of a topsy-turvy uh, career both uh, with the UFC and outside the UFC a few years ago, probably best defined by her run on the Ultimate Fighter season 26, capped off by her difficulties making the flyweight limit. Uh, her flyweight adventure kind of came to an end uh, last year. She moved up to Bantamweight and started right out by losing a decision to Bech Cohea last September. This year, she is 2-0 and thus far. Uh, having defeated Sarah Morris back in May, and then the crown jewel of her career so far, most would probably agree, just two weeks before UFC 253, she took on Julia Avila, a highly touted prospect, and handed her really the first decisive loss of her career, and that was just at the UFC Fight Night Watterson versus Hill card on September 12th. Facing her in this uh, Bantamweight bout will be Caitlin Vieira. Phenomeno is... 29 years old. She is 10 and 1 overall in her career. Uh, started out 10 and 0, including wins over uh, former title challengers Sarah McMahon and Kat Zingano. She lost her first career fight last December at UFC 245, getting punched out in the first round by even hotter prospect Irene Aldana. She is a product of the famed Nova Uniao camp. Jay Petri, why don't you tell us why that matters and then give us your pick for the fight? You know, this is a really unusual situation. And I feel like Catlin Vieto should actually call somebody, maybe call um, Josh Fabia or Stefan Bonner to, to, give her, <laughs> to give her a hand in this fight. And the reason why is because Didi, Andre Didi Pedineris, uh, uh, the, the head coach, the, 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 the patriarch, I guess you will, of Novo Uniao, uh, tested positive for COVID. Now, this is actually not the first time he believes he had COVID. Uh, he tested positive several months ago. And so the question is, was the test a false positive? Either way, the point is, Pedaneras is out. He's not going to be coaching Vieta, and that's that's a very difficult thing. And I believe this is going to affect the rest of her corner because the only person in her corner is former Bell Bellator uh, Bantamweight King Marcus Galvao, who we remember is the guy who made Joe Warren squeak in a Bellator title fight. So... That's kind of a difficult thing for a fighter to go from having a full camp, a full a full fight week and preparation into the fight, and then the fight itself. I think this is a difficult uh, mental and, and psychological thing more than a physical thing because Vieta has been through enough fight camps and know how to you know go through the motions. It's almost muscle memory at this point, but the the guidance and everything like that. I, there's only so much you can do on Skype or Zoom or from phone calls or video chats or anything like that. So this this is uh, concerning to me. Now, if 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 Pedineris has it, Novo Uniao is notoriously a very hands-on camp. So there's a lot of question marks on, you know, what if, is this, should this fight go on? This actually, and, and this is with all due respect to all the fighters involved, the most likely fight I expected that would not make it to fight night. And that is now doubly so because her head coach and and whatnot tested positive for COVID, and and that's uh you know that's a that's a difficult thing, but even though she's lost her head coach, and and support for the fight week, I still think Vieta physically is not going to be any different of a fighter, and I think that is where she makes the difference fighting against Sarge Eubanks. Now, Sarge fought in, in uh, originally in flyweight and was going to fight for the flyweight title, had issues making weight, kidney failure, et cetera, et cetera, finally moved up to bantamweight, 
And she still seems kind of undersized. She needs a 130 pound division that will never exist. And that's really unfortunate for Sarge because she is a strong grappler. And that is her bread and butter. That's what she brings to the table. She, if, if you want to talk about like other fighters earlier in the car that are punched their way in to get a takedown, like an Espino type, doubly so for Sarge Eubanks. She can wink bomb. She can throw the big right hand, but that's not important. That doesn't matter as much. If she can land the shot, cool. But closing the distance, getting the fight down, picking the, her opponent up. And Vienna is a big 135er. I think this is a difficult situation because, I mean, the, the size difference, I mean, they'll obviously be the same weight, but I believe Vieta has five inches on her and she's a, a, a genuinely built Bantamweight. And I think that this is the kind of thing that Sarge is going to run into that wall of maybe she can pick her up. Maybe she can, but she can't do that for three rounds. And and Vieta's the kind of fighter who sometimes can explode her way out of a position and, and kind of bully and 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 power her way through so in the power versus power game i got vieta in that and i think that whatever she does sarge may be the kind of fighter who will try and match that and that may not go in her favor um couple that with the fact that eubanks there's there's questions there's still questions about her cardio whether even though at a proper weight class can she hang for three rounds because you know the last round against avila you know the there, there were thoughts, you know, can she can she keep it going for five rounds? And Avila is a, a mid-sized Benway, but she's not a big big one in the scheme of things, whereas Vieta is. So I think this is the kind of fight that Vieta is going to in, appreciate. And then it's a top, still technically, I mean, it's a, a top 15 opponent for whatever that's worth. I think Sarge is number 13 right now. And it's the kind of thing that can bounce her back from that shocking knockout loss that happened with when everything was going her way until Irene Aldana just cold cocked her. And, and I think that we may not be treated to the most interesting stylistic matchup, and we may have the little thoughts in our head of embrace the grind as it turns into a prolonged clinch battle. Maybe it gets dragged to the ground. Maybe Vieta mixes in a takedown just to throw her off. But I just see this being 15 minutes of Vieta just being a little too big for for, for you, Banks. So I have Vieta by uh, on the scorecards. Keith, I know you're not a betting man, but is there even any temptation to throw a little something <laughs> on Eubanks at plus 160 where it looks like she's uh, she's sitting right now? Yeah, I, I definitely do um, because of, I mean, we've seen a well-rounded game from her. She looked great in her last fight. I shouldn't say great, but she looked, you know, good in her last fight. Uh, but I do have to correct uh, Jay's uh, news. Uh, she's going to have two corner men. Uh, I just found out Kobe Covington is actually going to corner her after Sajara Eubanks' comments about Kobe Covington. Wait, what? No, that's just a joke. I'm only kidding. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I thought I, think, I would have to rush over and go I, to I, news I, right I, now. Oh, come I, on. You're killing I, me, dog. I, I, uh, uh, that would, uh, you know, that would be pretty gangster of him to show up. And, and uh, he might not be too popular. He might want to stay away. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about Sajara Eubanks first. Um, I, I try to tend to talk about who I think is the bigger name. And I still think based on being a one-time title challenger, actually a two-time Title, title challenger, but actually never getting in the cage to challenge for those belts. If we, um, I'm actually shocked that Sajara Eubanks is 35. Like, and when you said that, I had to like double check. I'm like, ah, yeah, I know she's older. I thought she'd be like 31. I'm like, oh my god, she really is 35. Uh, she's one of these these fighters that I kind of liked, but she never lived up to potential, and that's because like every once in a while I see the spark and I get excited, and that's because she's. She, she can sh be well rounded, and I'm like, wow, her like box is really good. And then she gets outboxed by Betch Cohere, and I'm like, oh no, it's not. Um, what I've seen, she's she can be light on her feet. Uh, she can be a good pocket boxer, and I think a lot of that has to do with what Jay talks about being undersized. So she has to f box in the pocket. Uh, pretty good right hand, though she tends to kind of overlook for those like overhand right. She throws it like too much. She gets that kind of Dan Henderson thing going. Um, she doesn't have much power being undersized at 135. Uh, she can be backed up and pressured 
especially in like the Aspen Lad fight. She didn't like the pressure from Aspen Lad, and that's something Ketlin Vera is going to bring in this fight. Uh, Aspen Lad really beat her up in the clinch. Like that's where um, I thought the fight was separated for Lad. Uh, she's but as Jay said, I'm sure you're going to say she's good on the ground. She's got good takedowns. Good top control, but I don't know if she's gonna be able to do that based on like what Jay said. Is not only is uh, Sajara Eubanks undersized for the weight class, but Ketlin Vera is big for the weight class. Um, it has been two and a half years since she actually won, so I don't like that. Um, but we talk about her skill set. She's a counter striker, um, but she's raw on the feet. Like I think people over exaggerate how like Ketlin Vera's skills on the feet. Uh, she does like, she pulls her head back a lot. She does like, you know, what they call the pull attack, but she pulls it straight back. When you do that, you're supposed to pull it on an angle. She doesn't do that. Um, she's little, her hands a little slow. She throws looping punches from the hips. Uh, her best striking is when she's able to grab the back ahead and kind of dirty box. Like that's when she landed shots against, uh, Kat Singano was in the clinch. Uh, but she is a good grappler. She's got good takedowns. Um, I mean, she judo through. Sarah McMahon, a Olympic silver medalist wrestler. Uh, she's a judo black belt herself. Uh, good, good smothering top control. Uh, she's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Uh, she's a submission threat, like we just said about. She Not only did she throw Sarah McMahon, then she had an arm choked her and won a submission out for it. Um, she out-wrestled Kat Singano, who's known for her wrestling. Um, if she does end up on bottom, she can strike from on bottom. She's, um, she, you know, she's willing to attack while off her back. Uh, but she's very good at scrambling and get back to her feet. Uh, cardio is a concern, which is funny when you talked about Eubanks and Eubanks addressed that. Um, not her last one, but a couple wins ago, she's like, why is everyone talking about my cardio? Like I didn't gas in this fight, but Ketlin Vera like was way ahead on the scorecards from against Katsangano and then really slowed down the third round. And like some judge, Gave Katzengano the win because of it. Um, the the whole not having Andre Paneris in the corner that like that definitely makes me worry, and I it almost made me I, I shouldn't say almost made me change my pick, but it, it definitely made me less confident. Um, Eubanks is going to have to use a lot of movement and try to pick apart Vieira with her speed advantage, which I think she will have a better speed advantage. And I think she could definitely, um, even though she's smaller, she could use a distant out kickboxing game, but that just simply isn't her game. Like even when she's winning on the feet, she will want to turn into some grappling exchanges. And as Jay said, Vera is much bigger, probably the better grappler. I expect her to win those exchanges, and I think she wins a 30-27, maybe a 29 uh, You know, I'll go 29-28 decision for Ketlin Vieira. Great. Thank you. I do not often make specific predictions about specific exchanges or techniques that will take place in a fight. I'm just, I'm not that kind of analyst, but I'm going to make one. Sometime in the first round of this fight, you're going to see a sequence where the uh, Vieira and Eubanks will be up against the cage, probably because Eubanks pushed her there, and she'll be working for a takedown, probably down at her waist, working for a double leg takedown while Vieira is either defending herself with double underhooks or maybe working for a front headlock. The sequence will take 45 to 60 seconds. Eubanks will finally get Vieira down to the ground. Vieira will pop back up within five seconds, and when you see it happen, you will all know that Ketlin Vieira is winning this fight. It's going to take Sajara Eubanks so much gas to do the things that she will want to do in this fight. Because the thing is, cardio is not just about how much you have in the tank. It's also about how hard you step on the gas. You know, the classic example. BJ Penn always had plenty of gas when he was winning fights. He didn't have gas when he was losing fights. When he was winning fights, he could finish you in the fourth round. Sure. Because he was dictating the pace. He wasn't having to step on the gas any harder than he felt he wanted to or could in that moment. When it was someone dictating it to him, all of a sudden he's sucking wind at the end of the second round. I have the feeling that's what this is going to look like. I'm still a believer in Caitlin Vieta. Uh, I don't know if she's a future champ, but I think she's a future top five fighter and will probably make her way to a title shot in this division at some point, especially given just how starving it is for new faces, new contenders. If everything were completely equal, if uh, Didi were in Vieta's corner as normal, if Eubanks had not fought two weeks ago, I would still favor Vieta. I'm going to say those things are all just a wash. It will matter for Eubanks. She fought 15 hard minutes against a game fighter two weeks ago. 
I don't know this for a fact. I'm not in her camps, but she strikes me as a woman who has a cut to make even to get to 135. Uh, so it is going to take a little something out of her, and that something for the most part is going to be chin and gas. I don't know if Vieta will test her chin very much, but she will test her gas. Uh, give me Caitlin Vieta probably uh, 29 to 28, like Heath said. The third fight from the top of the UFC 253 card uh, features flyweights, either an indication of the increased shine the UFC is giving its men's 125-pound division or an indication, as we discussed earlier, of just what this card is populated with outside of the top two fights. In either case, it is Kai Cara France and Brandon Royval who are benefiting. Cara France is 27 years old. He is 21 and 8 overall. He is 4 and 1 in the UFC with wins over Tyson Nam, Mark De La Rosa, Howley and Paiva, and Elias Garcia, and the sole loss coming to uh, fellow hot prospect Brandon Moreno. Brandon Royval, 28 years old, 11 and 4, faced Tim Elliott, former title challenger at UFC on ESPN 9, Woodley versus Burns earlier this year, and put him away with a second-round arm triangle choke. Before that, he had come up through the Legacy Fighting Alliance promotion where he was a dominant star for them. Who do you have in this flyweight showcase, Jay Petri? I, I'm looking forward to this fight in that I believe that we could get upwards of 15 minutes of fury. And, and sure, we've probably been picking a lot of decisions tonight, but there's decisions, in the, you know, there's the heavyweight, you know, not quite old big man submission, but almost that kind of thing for 15 minutes. We get bummed out. it, And then there's the kind of flyweight, you know, twin Tasmanian devils going at it. I, I really enjoy this matchup because I like Brandon Royville as his, his approach to the game is, is one of those entertaining styles. He's going to go for the finish from opening bell until the very end. Now this can kind of burn him out and he can kind of run out of gas uh, most of his finishes have come, uh, I think actually all of his finishes have come within two rounds, if I remember correctly. So he's he's a rare flyweight indeed. And, and we've seen him in the LFA. When guys can beat him, they're not finishing him. They're just surviving until he until he either gasses out or until his his attacks, his spinning strikes, his flying stuff, his very unorthodox for a flyweight attack doesn't have the same uh, pep on it. It doesn't quite have the same oomph. The power isn't quite there. The the chokes and the the maneuvers he's going for just don't quite have the same mustard on it. And I think that's where Kai Kaikara France is going to take advantage of this fight. I see this fight being a round of mayhem. Absolute mayhem. Royville's going to do everything he can to get the Australian to the ground. The, the New Zealander, not the Australian. He's going to try and get the city kickboxer to the ground. And I think that he might. I think that he very well might get the fight there. But I think that Car France is going to be able to spring back to his feet and kind of frustrate Royville and in, in not quite a same style where they'll be trapped against the fence until he finally hits a takedown and gets back up. But I just feel that this is the kind of frenetic pace for five minutes that that it's going to be a, a whole lot of fun to watch. And then once that happens, you'll see the rare instance of a flyweight running out of steam because that's not something that normally we run into in the, in the UFC. Now, Brandon Royville, he, he, he wants the submission. He wants to choke you. He wants to rip your arm off. He'll settle for an arm triangle if he needs to. That's how he got Tim Elliott out of there. Um, and you remember that the Tim Elliott fight was a fun scramble. Well, I mean, a lot of you can look at Tim Elliott's career and you can see that he's had those kind of fights many times before. Uh, Lewis, the Lewis Smoka fight, you can remember. Smoka and Elliott had that kind of wild, crazy scramble fest. This could be that kind of wild, crazy scramble fest for the first five minutes. And then you can see Car France start to, to take the uh, get the upper hand. The only guy to beat him in recent memory was Brandon Marino, who did so, oddly enough, by outstriking Car France. And that's that's something I didn't quite see coming because I know Marino is a just another dynamic guy. Um, but he got wild and his best tool was the jab. He snapped that jab out there again and again and again and worked Kai Car France over. Brandon Royville is not that kind of guy. He's not going to outbox you on the feet. He's not going to slug you out. He might land some shots, but it's a means to an end. You know, you have to go back a long ways for him to finish somebody. I think it was back in the WSOF days. That tells you how long ago it's been. Um, 
I see Kaikar France getting through the first round of hell and then and then being able to to stay away, get out of danger, not get taken down, stuff shots and get his boxing up and 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 cruise to a, a good 29-28. I see it much the same as you actually, Jay. You you kind of outlined very much the dynamic I see going on. Uh Royval will come out and do his rabid Wolverine thing. Uh against LFA level fighters, that usually ends with uh Royval getting a rear naked joke you know, sometime in the first round or, or maybe, you know, halfway into the second at this level, I don't know, like just people have not dummied Kaikara France on, on the ground like that. Uh, even though I'm a believer in Royval and I think he has sticking power in the UFC, I've gone back and forth on this. Uh, I think I was asked who you got about this fight on Monday and I picked Royval, but I, the, the more I'm thinking about it and the more I'm kind of, you know, like, digging into their games, the more I think Royval wins the first round and Car France wins the second and third. And by the third, Royval can't get him down anymore. And I don't know how much France will have left in the tank either, but uh, he'll have enough to win the round. Keith, do you disagree with this or are you on board? Well, I actually, um, I think you guys hit this like perfectly. So this was the fight that I had the hardest time picking. This is the one I kind of flip-flopped. I did like probably more tape study than I should because, <laughs> you know, sometimes you just go with your first instinct. Uh, but then I start, you know, I, I see avenues for these guys to win. So Kai Kara France, the thing that always jumps out to me is just, and, and I should say this about pretty much every top flyweight, but especially him is how well-rounded he is. Now, Jay brought up the Brandon Moreno fight and I, I agree. Brandon Moreno um, was, you know, hurt him on the feet uh, you know, it was a jab, was very active with a jab. He kept the pressure on him, was kind of forcing Kyra, Kyra France to fight off his back foot a lot. But Brandon Moreno hits hard. Like, I feel like that was the difference between the Kyra France and the Moreno fight is they both probably landed close to the same amount, but, like, Moreno landed the good ones. Um, but Kyra, Kyra France, he keeps a high guard. Uh, he works, you know, he has a good jab himself. He you know, basically just punches straight down the pipe kind of guy um, with his straight right being like his money shot, especially his slip. Like he does really good a slip side to side and he has like a slip right hand. Um, that was actually the shot that he was landing on Moreno when he was uh, having success. Um, but I think everything works off of his head moment because he, he does so well to like bounce his head off the center line, but always keeping himself in range and keeping up, you know, the high output that other flyweights have to so that you know stay in a fight um but what's really what i really like about the way he slips is that he's he's added this high kick to it like he'll slip like it makes it look like he's you know just doing his regular slip into the side but then while he does that he'll sneak up this high kick which um he's done really well to land on people and it's it's so hard to see it coming because you're thinking he's doing something defense and next minute a uh, high kick's coming at and you know at your chin uh, he, but then he also attacks with those calf kicks, which I like. He's showed that he's been really good in scrambles uh, throughout his entire UFC career. Um, he stuffed some takedowns. Um, whether it is uh, he loves he loves doing the switch, or he even does like the you know if you know what a wrestling spladel is, he like he'll use that defense to kind of um, not so necessarily win or stop the takedown, but just uh, or or to win the takedown, but to just can create a scramble so he can be on his feet where he feels most comfortable. Now Roy Val, very athletic. Uh, I like that he's southpaw, long and lengthy. Uh, he's got a long jab that he uses so well to. Uh, he uses to he uses his length uh, as so many fighters use their length to keep distance. He uses his length to close distance. He follows the jab in. Uh, he does keep his hands low, which kind of takes away, I think, some of his power. But you're talking about a lot of kicks, like Jay said, uh, flashy stuff, flying stuff, spinning attacks. Uh, very weak defensive wrestler, but that's because he's so comfortable being on the ground. Like you could shoot on his hips, and he's probably gonna jump to a guillotine and try to fight, finish it. Then uh, when he hits it on the ground, it's actually when it becomes most dangerous. He's he's so good at grappling, so flexible. Subs from pretty much every position. He'll catch a sub in a scramble. Um, has like a very uh, his hips are always rolling. He has that like funk style wrestling. If 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 people follow like amateur wrestling, uh, uh, college wrestling, if they know what like a funk style wrestler is. Uh, that's what he does a lot. I love this fight. I I don't have a confident pick, 
but I actually really like your break. All, both of you guys had a similar breakdown. Royville's best chance, I think, is early. I think it's on the ground with a sub. I think the longer it stays on the feet, it should start going to France. France is going to struggle early on with the length, with the flashy stuff, getting past that stuff. But when he, I think he has too many weapons on his feet, and and eventually, you know, the high level experience. I think it will take over late. So I think it's three for three. We're all saying Rival early with Kaikar France surviving the early onslaught and then getting a 29 20 decision. So uh, a unanimous right away. This uh, all, all the same exact way. That brings us to our co main event. Five rounds, if it takes five rounds, of action in the light heavyweight division as Dominic Reyes and Jan Blachowicz. Duke it out for the light heavyweight title recently vacated by longtime divisional kingpin John Jones. Before we even talk about Reyes and Blahovich, let's just get the the 800 or 205 pound elephant in the room out of the way. Uh, Jones started making noise about vacating the title. Uh, it was seemed to be a combination of teasing fights at heavyweight and dissatisfaction with his contract status. I'm not sure a lot of us believed it was real until it was real, but sure enough, he stepped away. The UFC took him at his word, and he has given no signs of going back on that word. So all of a sudden, what would be a top-level contender's fight is a title fight. Jay Petri of uh, Reyes and Blahovich and the other, say, top five or six light heavyweight contenders in the UFC, who should be the happiest that John Jones is out of the picture for now? You know, it's actually not going to be one of the guys that will be the champion at the end of this night, which is which is kind of funny to think because you you'd expect that the champion would the new champion will be so celebrating. But I think the happiest person is going to be Glover Teixeira because he's fighting Tiago Santos. This is actually uh, news today that he'll be he's rebooked against Tiago Santos uh, in November to headlight the November seventh card. Uh, and of all the people that had a path to uh, uh, another light heavyweight title shot, I feel like Glover Teixeira's was the most difficult because of the performance that he had against John Jones. I mean, you, you could argue that, sure, Anthony Smith, he looked even worse against Jones, but Smith has fallen into hard times, whereas Glover Teixeira is 40 years old on the longest win streak in the past seven years. So I think that if Glover gets by Tiago Santos, which is a, obviously a huge if, I think this this could be a very strange time for the UFC's light heavyweight division, uh, and and I think also who wins are the hardcore fans because we have a mini tournament. We have Reyes versus Blahovich one and three. We have Santos versus Teixeira two and four, and then the winner of that and the winner of that will go together for like a a, a de facto four man tournament. So I I think this is kind of a we lucked out, although we're always always going to have that little thought in the back of our head, but man, Jones beat Reyes, Jones beat Santos, Jones beat Teixeira. They never, he never fought John, uh, but man, oh man, this is, this, this, this could have the makings of something fun. So I think that Glover and then the, us, the, the people who really appreciate this kind of matchup. Do you agree, Keith? Yeah, I actually, I think I agree. Um, as far as, who benefits more? Like I was when I was thinking about this matchup between Reyes and Blahovitz, I was kind of on the fence. Like who? I would say, well, Blahovitz is in this position because John Jones has left. If John Jones is still a champion, I don't know if they would have gave Blahovitz the the title shot. I think they might have done the rematch with Reyes anyways, because many people thought Reyes, myself included, thought Reyes should have won the first fight, got the decision. Now, if Reyes wins. He has that, you know, he's got that chance to say, yeah, I ran John Jones away from, the, you know, out of the division. That's how scared he is for me. I beat him, and he, he ran away, you know, for years he didn't want to go to heavyweight. I should have got the decision, and then he ran away. Now, as far as John Jones leaving the division, no, well, hold on, let me answer that question. I apologize. Who benefits most is actually neither one of those guys. Who benefits most might be Stephen Miocic because, you know, he's a heavyweight champion of the world. He's going to have, you know, if he fights John Jones, which to me, I, I this talk about Francis Ngannou getting the first shot to me is absolutely insanity to me. If John Jones wants to move up to heavyweight, why are we not giving the greatest fight of all time who we've been waiting for years to move up to heavyweight? Why do we chance to take a chance of that fight not happening? 
Stephen Miocic to fight a guy that we've already seen a beat. That to me is, I mean, Cody Garbrandt gets the first shot at a flyweight title shot, but John Jones, the greatest fighter of all time, doesn't. That to me, that's insane. But anyways, back to the point. If Stipe can beat John Jones, I mean, heavy, the, the greatest heavyweight, you know, the, the greatest UFC heavyweight cha- champion or UFC heavyweight has already been sealed. In many eyes, the greatest heavyweight has already been sealed. If he beats John Jones, that's sealed. And then we start talking about maybe just greatest fighter in period. Like he starts moving, you know, he's outside the club. Now he's in the club at least. Um, do I think it's a good move? And I know we don't want, you know, we want to keep on the event, but is it a good move for John Jones with heavyweight? I actually think it, it is. One, of course, the heavyweight title has a lot more uh, ring to it. You know, baddest man on the planet has a lot more ring to it, uh, cachet than light heavyweight championship, which, you know, to casual fans, you say light heavyweight, they go, is that John Jones' division? Is that Anderson Silva's division? Is that Brock Lesnar's? They, they don't know. Um, but also, John Jones is aging. He is, I mean, uh, you know, he's on, he's on the side of 30 now. He's had a history of cocaine, DUIs, partying, like, you know, not taking care of his body like a high-level athlete should. And just your natural, like, slowing down. Well, usually if you're slowing down, you can do much better at heavyweight than you do at light heavyweight. I said... And I've been saying it for a while. I think John Jones wrestling is fading big time to the point where he's almost just a striker at this point. And the risk reward, I actually think it's a riskier, like I think that there's better competition. And strictly when I say competition, I'm talking Dominic Reyes. I think Dominic Reyes is a bigger threat to John Jones than CP Milchers is. Like I think that's an easier matchup at this point than than CPA is. Uh, excuse me, than uh yeah, I think Dominic Reyes is a tougher matchup than Steve Miocic is. So that's why it's a good idea. I think it was a good idea for John Jones to give away the title and move up to heavyweight, which obviously would do more for his legacy, too, if he wins the heavyweight title. So you're saying that Reyes versus Steve is your next fight, then? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, 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 th- I, th- I don't know if I've already... I mean, I, I, I'll go first if you want. I think I kind of gave away my pick. Uh, well, let me just give the, the rundown of the facts and figures real quick, okay. and, and I'll toss the hot potato right back to you. Uh, Reyes is 30 years old. He is 12-1 and one in his career. He picked up his first career loss at the hands of Jones at UFC 247 uh, down here in Houston, right in front of Jay's and my faces. Uh, before that, he had beaten Chris Weidman, Volkan Uzdemir, Oban St. Pru, Jared Cannonier, Jeremy Kimball, and Joaquin Christensen to win his first six UFC bouts in a row. And it is worth noting that the loss to Jones was somewhat controversial. I'm not looking at MMA decisions right now, but I think even a majority of media watching the fight might have awarded it to, uh, to Reyes. I, I gave it to Reyes, but uh, Razor close fight. Taking him on will be Jan Bohovic. The pole is 37 years old. He is 26 and eight in his career. And, I mean, I'll give a side note that it is somewhat surprising to see him in the spot he is right now in contention for a UFC title. He had a rough run of it when he joined the UFC from uh, KSW. I went two and four in his first six fights in the octagon, and he was probably fighting for his continued employment when he took on uh, Devin Clark about three years ago and, uh, and choked him out. However... Since that uh, two and four run to start uh, his UFC career, he is seven and one in his last eight. The only loss would be to Tiago Santos, fellow top contender, uh, this or last February. Otherwise, he has beaten Corey Anderson, Honado Jacare Souza, Luke Rockhold, Nikita Krilov, Jimmy Manoa, Jared Cannonier, and the aforementioned Clark. With that all out of the way, and by the way, uh, Reyes is a comfortable favorite right now, sitting around minus 270. You can get Bohovic around plus 230. It sounds like you're going in favor of the Devastator, Keith. Am I right or am I wrong? Yeah, so I usually don't like to bury the lead, uh, who I'm taking, but yeah, I guess I will. I, uh, I'm taking Dominic Reyes. I So when I did film study on Dominic Reyes versus John Jones, 
uh, you know, everyone was saying, oh, my God, this is another easy win for Don, Don Jones. Why is he fighting this guy? We're making jokes on it. And when I did film study, I said, I kept saying to people, like, no, like, I think Dominic Reyes is a real legit threat. Like, this might be his, I, I think I was saying, this is his toughest threat since Daniel Cormier. And I ended up going with John Jones on every breakdown I did. But I think I was the only person who was, like, saying, like, no, this is like 51, 49. Like, that's how confident I, like, least confident I am in this. And while I guess technically I got the fight right by picking John Jones, I, I feel like I got it wrong. Like, I feel like I cowered. And if I went with Dominic Reyes, I would feel much better about myself than I do. Now, the reason why I that really jumped out with Dominic Reyes when I really did film study, I really got to understand that comment where he kept saying, I'm the best athlete john jones ever fought and everyone kept i felt like everyone kept taking him out of context because they kept saying like he's faced olympic you know level wrestlers he's taking on this and i don't think he meant by credentials i don't think he meant like yeah i'm the most credentialed you know obviously daniel Cormier was in the olympics and you know this and that and what i think he meant was when you did def- when you define an athlete when we describe an athlete and we give a webster dictionary dominic race fits that he is the great blend of size, length, speed, balance, power, explosion, like all the characteristics of an athlete. And if you broke down all of the opponents that John Jones has faced, you could say, you know, uh, Vito B. Belfort had the speed, but he didn't have the length. And, 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 you know, all these different things. You could break them all down. I thought Dominic Ray was the first one that checked all the boxes. But... He is not just an athlete. He is so technically sound. Um, everyone always talks about his left hand. I'm going to pause on the left hand for a second. His right hook is 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 fantastic. His jab is, I mean, he's a southpaw, so his jab is fantastic. His But his left hand is deadly. And, and because, because it's so good, it's become the narrative similar to like Conor McGregor where people say, oh, all Conor McGregor is a left hand. And it's like, no, actually Conor McGregor could – win MMA fights with just his right hand. But the left hand is so good. I feel the same way about Dominic Reyes' left hand, but I also feel the same way with his kicks. Um, he does so well at, like, like has almost like your, your Romero thing where he kind of, like, lulls, 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 and then explodes. Like, he'll dart into his range and land something because he's so explosive. He's so good, especially in the John Jones fight, especially early at slipping just out of the range of the strikes and into a counter, like, like step back, boom. He's and and when I just said step back, he's one of the best strikers while reversing. I mean, uh, the step back uppercut that he put out, uh, uh, Ovin Pru with step back left hand. He put out Chris Weidman with, uh, it, it might've been reversed. I can't remember what, but he landed uh, a step back uppercut and a step back, um, uh, left hand. That was sensational. Um, and his kicks are brutal, all areas to the body, to the head. To, you, you know, like you go back to the LFA days, he was like a highlight reel knockout that got him into the UFC. Um, he was working Johns to the body, to his legs. Um, but then also his takedown defense. And John Jones was forced to have to try to wrestle him, and he couldn't get him down. And when he did get him down, he scrambled up. I mean, the top control time was like altogether was like two seconds. Um, his cardio faded in the fifth. And even really the fourth. And I think that's a little bit of inexperience that he, you know, he, he tried ending John Jones early. And I think that paid, you know, cost him, co- end up costing the fight, though I still scored it for John Jones. Now I'm going to jump over to, to Juan Hovitz, though I already said who, who I think is going to win. John, uh, excuse me, Juan Hovitz, if you told me I was at UFC 210 when he went against Patrick Cummins, and Patrick Cummins like took him down. Oh. Let him back, you know, he'd scram back up, take him down, take it down. If you told me that that guy would be fighting for a light heavyweight title one day, I would have been thinking you're talking about a regional scene and it's not even a guy who deserves a title shot, but you're just using like UFC veteran as a name to get over somebody. Like that's what I mentioned. If you told me Jan Mahovic would be fighting for a UFC title and deserving, like, like, like he deserves it. It's not something like, you know, someone fell out and it was like right place, right time. Um, so, yeah, he's what what impressed me is that he's able to fight from both stances. Though um, I don't like how he can be overly cautious. Like he gives too much respect. He, um, he wants to fight at a slow pace. Uh, he works behind a jab. Uh, good leg kicks. 
I think his best striking is actually his clinch striking. Um, his takedown defense is the thing that really is pressing. Like that has greatly, drastically improved. I mean, he was like the worst rest, defensive wrestler on the roster. Now he's hard to take down, and now he's actually uh, using his grappling. I mean, he's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. I mean, he su- submitted Nikita Krylov. But when I look at Ron Yehovich and it's something like that mystery, like nothing jumps out the page for me. Dominic Reyes jumps off the page for me, and then you add in the fact that in my opinion, he just beat John Jones. This guy's confidence, hopefully not overconfidence and cockiness, but his confidence right now must be going through the roof because we've never seen anybody do to John Jones, you know, what Dominic Reyes did. And he's also still, I mean, he's not that young in age, but he's young in his career in the sport where he's at the point where he, he should still be, like, he's still getting better. Like, I feel like he's still climbing up the mountain. Um I think Jan could land like his left hook and put him out, but to me, that's it. He's got a one punch shot. I think Reyes comes out of the gate in a, in a, in a like hurry and a fury. I expect him to brutalize him to the body, and I think he takes him out in the very first round. I think Dominic Reyes wins by first round. But listen, one thing I always like to pride myself: I like to go bold, and I'm going to say how it happens. When I was watching film study of the Thiago Santos fight, Thiago Santos kept kicking. Uh, Jan Wachowicz in the body, and Jan Wachowicz started doing, um, he started pillaring the body, where you kind of bring in the elbows in, or he was trying to catch the leg. I think Dominic Reyes is going to hurt him to the body, see him, see him Wachowicz dropping his hands, and then he's going to flick one up to the head. I think he's going to knock him out with a head kick in the first round. Outstanding. Uh, Keith, definitely uh, feeling what the Vegas odds makers are putting down on that this one. I will tell you that when this fight was first announced and for the for the first good long while that I thought about it, my initial gut feeling was that this had some of the earmarks of an upset special. That people are going to be like way too high on, on Reyes, going to forget the things that Blahovich does well. And I see ways that Blahovich could, could kind of put the pieces together and, and win this fight and kind of shock the world. I mean, it doesn't sound like a shock the world moment when you're plus 230. Those kind of upsets happen almost every weekend. But just in terms of the the eyeball test and Reyes being someone that otherwise would probably be back in a title fight against John Jones right now, it would certainly feel like a shocking moment. But the more I thought about it, the more I, I realized that in order to win this fight, Bohovich would need to put those component parts together. Uh, his jab, which is good going going forward or going backward, his cardio that went from a serious liability to a serious asset in a way it has for very few high-level fighters that I can think of in UFC history. But he would need to put the, the pieces together in a way that I'm not sure he actually has at any point in his career. And anytime I'm trying to like justify an, a fight outcome happening by you know, a bunch of circumstances coming together that have never actually happened before. I suddenly realize I'm just trying to talk myself into something. So I have returned to the realm of common sense. I have Reyes in this one. I don't know if, if he'll spark uh, Blahovich in the first round, the way, you know, that the Keith is feeling it. Although I can certainly see it happening. If not, I can see him doing enough damage in the first two or three rounds that even if Bohovich is the guy pulling ahead at the end, Reyes has got this thing banked away and he's not so dead that Bohovich is going to finish him. So uh, give me Dominic Reyes, your new UFC light heavyweight champion by unanimous and not that close decision. You know, maybe 249, 46 is in a 50, 45 type situation, or maybe he even gets a 10, eight first round or second round. Jay, is there dissension in the ranks? I, I saw you smirking at me over the Skype because you heard my off the cuff. I, I think Bohovich has got this a while back. You know, we, we touched on this a little bit earlier when we were talking about the Diego Sanchez fight where we were kind of arguing what is a way that we can see this ex-fighter win this fight? And you feel, you feel you almost have to talk yourself into a way where you can see this happening because otherwise it's almost a foregone conclusion. Well, Jake Matthews is going to run run over Diego Sanchez. Where in this situation, I found myself looking at Jan Blahovich's style and what he brings to the table and, and the fact that he's 37 years old with a lot of miles on him. By the way, he was a very, very accomplished and experienced KSW fighter before 
uh, joining the, the UFC roster. I believe he only fought for, oh no, he had a, a fight or two otherwise, but KSW then UFC for the most part. Now, Blahovich has a couple strikes. He has a couple, he has the power. He absolutely has the power to finish this fight within the first two rounds. And if he doesn't do it that way, I, I don't see what he's going to be able to do to slow down the 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 uh, snowballing Reyes, who is just coming at him, and he's not backing off, and 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 he's doing some damage too, and he's working that thing that Keith is very excited about, that head kick. I think that this is going to be one of those RoboCop, na 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 as he's aiming the a, aiming the head kick, getting the timing down, getting what he needs to do to unleash it by setting it up, by going to the body, by going low, so that. Reyes drops his guard and pop bang to the head. I don't feel this will be the kind of thing that happens in the first round. I feel this is the kind of thing where we we are treated to something very interesting uh, for the first probably I give I give it two rounds of of almost not quite a toss up, but a very competitive fight. And I say that knowing that we can look through this, these fighters and almost pick pick at and kind of. Uh, retroactively go, oh, that isn't that great of a performance. Oh, he took a split decision over Esdemir. Oh, he knocked out Chris Wyvern, or Chris wyvern has been knocked out by everybody. You know, the, the, the front door knocked him out the other day, so that's not that big of a win. <laughs> Whereas Blahovich had also those kind of performances. Like, do you think you can probably count the number of top five wins on one hand? Corey Anderson and maybe Jimmy Manu at the time, like Jacare Sosa was not a ranked light heavyweight. Uh, Luke Rockhold was on a ranked light heavyweight. Tiago Santos was, and he got posterized in, in the third round of their headliner. And despite that, these guys have found their way to the to the title. And I mentioned earlier how there's a light heavyweight uh, de facto tournament that is kind of playing out. And the most interesting thing about this, the only rematch that I can see is if Blahovich wins and Tiago Santos beats Clever Teixeira because they fought before. I believe... Every other matchup on of these four fighters would be a fresh fight, which is very exciting for in a division that you think everybody had lost to the champion. So I like I like this matchup. I like the action and the violence potential. Like the the night fight earlier and earlier on, Knight versus Kamer might hit that violence threshold. But I think this is another light heavyweight banger that can really deliver for the first couple rounds, and then we see Vlahovic taper off. Reyes get the upper hand. I see a finish. Uh, I see a, a TKO type finish, um, like head kick and head kick and punches in maybe the third or fourth rounds. Once Blahovic starts to to not be able to get his guard up quite quick enough, because Reyes can fire up that head kick fast, and he can do it fast in the fourth round. I I believe it was the fourth round that he hurt Jones, and we we thought, oh my gosh, and then Jones came back and and won the round. I could be mistaken on that. That's just fine. Um, but the point is, is that Reyes, I believe he has more ways to win this fight. And and I think, oddly enough, if this fight goes to the crown, it's because Jan took, took it down. And that would be a very unusual and unexpected thing, even though Jan averages over a takedown of every 15 minutes. Uh, I, I see Reyes just hitting harder, doing more damage, and getting the finish. That brings us to the main event of UFC 253, Adesanya versus Costa. And I think I speak for the entire panel in just saying how thankful I am that the UFC did not build a season of the Ultimate Fighter around this matchup as they briefly threatened to do. Having said that, this is only the second men's title fight in UFC history between two undefeated fighters. The first would, of course, be uh, when Lyoto Machida knocked out Rashad Evans, and then Ronda Rousey had four of them, winning the first three and losing to Holly Holm. Nonetheless, this is a uh, a rare occurrence. Uh, two completely undefeated, and in this case, uh, undefeated, untied, no-no contest, two guys with completely clean records taking each other on, and it will be for the UFC middleweight title. Israel Adesanya, it sounds like a cliché, uh, a hackneyed phrase to say it, but he is someone who has absolutely taken the sport by storm. He was SureDog.com's Breakthrough Fighter of the Year for 2018. 
He was just the flat out fighter of the year for 2019. He is 19 and 0 in his career. 8 and 0 in the UFC. He has beaten Rob Wilkinson, Marvin Vittori, Brad Tavares, Derek Brunson, Anderson Silva, Kelvin Gastelum, Robert Whitaker, and most recently at UFC 248 in March, Yoel Romero. He is a product of City Kickboxing, and he is 31 years old. Paulo Costa, 29 years old. Ohachinha, the eraser, is 13 and 0. Perhaps a quieter rise to uh, prominence and title contention than Adesanya had. Quieter in every way except for the actual sounds coming out of his mouth, which you would agree with if you have followed the promotional buildup to this fight at all. 13 and 0, 5 and 0 in the UFC, having defeated Gareth McClellan, Oluwale Bangboje, Johnny Hendricks. Uriah Hall, and most recently for him as well, Yoel Romero, last August at UFC 241. Jay Petri, if Adesanya wins this, where do you where do you place him among the greatest uh, UFC middleweights of all time? I I would I would place him at number two, and I say that with knowing the asterisks are very much in tow for Anderson Silva. Uh, I I do believe that Silva is still going to be far and away uh, the the greatest UFC middleweight that we've had. And I think that will be the case until Adesanya, uh, assume assume he gets past Paul Acosta and then fights, I don't know, Whitaker in a rematch or Cannonier beats Whitaker and then fights Jack Hermanson. And then we start to kind of circle through the rankings to go who's next. And there's not really a, 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 a clear cut contender yet because Edmund Shabazian just got, you know, snuffed out by Derek Brunson. Um, and, and I think that this is a statement performance. This is a, a, a the kind of legacy building, put the stamp on it fight that, that Adesanya wants because it's not a defeated guy. There are not a ton of undefeated fighters that, that have fought for the titles across UFC history. And then you add to the fact that they're both undefeated. It just adds that much more to it. Um, Adesanya has a whole lot to lose, and especially given the trash talk, but I... I think that that Adesanya can pretty firmly step over Weidman with in this performance uh, if he beats Costa. So you're saying he's already passed with Rich Franklin either way? <sighs> yes, I think so because the modern era is is and versus the the I mean the Rich Franklin era was still the modern era technically, but the, I believe the UFC throws him in the pioneer wing. For for whatever reason, because there's a, a timing and a cutoff that we're not privy to, uh, I, I think so. I, I think it has to, some of it might have to do with level of competition, but of course that's a relative thing. But you look at the guys he's beaten. Uh, Robert Whitaker was the heir apparent, and he did what he did and, and finished him. Yoel Romero on two losses was still the the boogeyman, quote unquote, and 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 he also has that win over Anderson Silva that Rich Franklin never could get. Keith. Would you agree with that assessment? Well, I mean, I don't really count like a win over Anderson Silva do much for his legacy at this point. Um, so obviously Anderson Silva is number one. We're all going to say that. Sure. And there's a huge gap between one and two. And to me, there's a couple guys. You you mentioned Rich Franklin. He wasn't one of the ones I thought of. And, and I wasn't really prepared for this. So I'm like, I haven't broke oh. down their records. And, and, and but He's in the no, club just, for number two. Yeah, he, like he's in the club for number two. The other two guys that jumped out to me is still Chris Weinman. Um, he had a nice run as the champion. He does his his wins over Anderson Silva mean a lot more to me than than Adesanya at this point. And the other guy who, you know, he didn't he wasn't on top of the mountain or as long as Adesanya uh, has been already, and and how long he's gonna be, who knows? But being being ranked for ten years in the top 10 in Michael Bisbing, like that matters. So I I might still have Wyman and Bisbing like ahead of him at this point, but it's like, he's in that car that's, you know, accelerating and catching up. He's, he's, you know, he's on that, you know, catching the air and he's drifting them and all that. Whatever. I, I'm not a NASCAR guy. I try to use a NASCAR <laughs> reference, but like he's, he's making up ground on these guys. So uh, if he hasn't passed them, he's right there. Yeah, I'm worth noting that just on the statistical level, 
if Adesanya wins, he'll be only the fourth person to defend the middleweight title more than once. Uh, okay. Franklin defended it twice, Weidman three times, and Silva nine times. So it was, well, say that again, who, who defended how many times? Like Franklin many? twice, Weidman three times, Silva nine times. But no, you forgot Murillo Bustamante. He, he defended he it once. Nope, he defended it twice in the same night against Matt Lindland. Oh, that, that that's true. <laughs> so he, he joins the club. He tapped him out twice, uh, you know, twice in one night. Right, right, right now, like ninety percent of the list is like one. Who what? the hell is Murillo Bustamante? And two, <laughs> how do you beat him twice in the same night? That's a great. Go look that. Go look up that one. Um, That's pretty amazing, though. <laughs> All right, with a little bit of the kind of historical to do out of the way, uh, Jay, who do you have in this matchup? Who takes it home? You know, I, I'm I'm really intrigued by this fight because of the the inherent risk that Paulo Costa presents for as far as he can muster it. Like, I will preface this by saying that Paulo Costa, for the first time in his career, he went out of the second round in his last fight against Yel Romero. So we really have no idea what he can do once the championship rounds come into play. We don't. I mean, the first how many fights? All of his fights before the UFC and his debut and then the first round. And they ended, most of the time, ended, you know, minute mark, sub-minute mark, 68, uh, let me see, 77 seconds a couple times. So this is the kind of guy who is wanting to get the fight done with early. He doesn't get paid by the hour, so to speak. He he wants to, to get this done and go home. And that is a terrifying prospect for, for Israel Adesanya for five minutes. And then once that, that the storm is, is, is ridden out, I think that he's, he's going to enjoy himself. But I don't want to step on myself and, and, and break down exactly some of the things I'll say in the Prime Picks article, article for Sure Dog, but I will say this fight to me feels like it'll play out like the 2020 version of Holly Holm versus Ronda Rousey, in that there will be a hyper aggressive charge forward, recklessly trying to take the head off and do some do something crazy, um, and and end up maybe looking foolish along the way just with such an uh, offense heavy attack that it will it will almost play to their disadvantage and Adesanya the kickboxer um can you know enjoy that he can he can kick back and literally and and relax and 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 pepper at and 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 chip at him and get leg kicks off and work the body maybe even throw up a couple head kicks because he's good with that and this is the kind of style matchup that is only dangerous if you are afraid of getting hit and and if Adesanya finds himself standing still looking a little concerned over respecting the power of Costa or deciding I can take it and and getting to a brawl with that for, with Costa that's a very very dangerous prospect but I think otherwise this is the kind of matchup where Adesanya who has an eight inch reach advantage and is taller longer in the legs too I, I'm pretty sure um can can really enjoy and almost feast on this kind of situation because Costa, he tends to be kind of a bull rusher more than a tactical cut you off at the cage and 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 he'll he'll chase you down. Like there were times in the Romero fight where he would plod forward towards him. Romero would eat the shots and stick his tongue out. We we wondered if he had the broken jaw. And and Adesanya, we're not we really don't know if he could take those same shots because Calvin Gastelum cracked him. And he and he got him good and and surprised him, and I think Costa won't be won't be able to surprise Adesanya like that. But he has the power to you know, if if Adesanya lets his guard down, lets a kick, you know, throws a naked body kick or something, and leaves it out too long, a, a counter right hand or something could hurt him really badly. I don't see that happening, but I can imagine that kind of situation, you know, where where he he. Adesanya gets a little too careless, a little too casual, and goes, oh, I got this. I have this in the bag, and and decides to play around with him a little bit and gets cracked. Not quite like Anderson Silva versus Chris Weidman, but, you know, kind of having a little fun showboating a little bit, doing some dances and kind of dodging out of the way and doing an actual matador. I actually believe that that before the fight's over, Adesanya will probably hold up a fake flag to pretend to be holding off the bull that is Paulo Costa. I see Adesanya picking him apart over five rounds. Um, I don't think it'll be very close. 
unless Costa hurts him. I, I don't think that will really happen. There may be some scary moments, and there may be some hair blown back. Uh, the pink hair, or whatever color it is now, may be a little knocked back after a couple whiffing shots from Costa. But I just I believe that Adesanya is the more technically sound fighter. He's quicker. He might not be faster in terms of a, a fast twitch muscle kind of way, but he's elusive. He has good head movement. I think he's got the kind of striking to, to give a veritable bull, an active bull, by the way. He has a crazy strikes per minute number. I mean, Costa will land at a crazy clip. And I believe that that I've signed he can stay out of the way long enough to 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 ride out the worst part of it and then cruise to a uh, maybe a, a 49 46 kind of decision. All right. I'm with you on the general dynamic of the fight. I think this is going to be a great one. It wasn't that long ago. It was earlier this year that we saw Adesanya and Romero put on one of the more dreadful title fights in UFC history. It was just absolutely awful. And it was two guys that were all too willing to wait for the other guy to pull the trigger first. That will not be an issue here. Costa likes to go first. He likes to throw first. He likes to land first. He likes to force the action. We've never seen his gas tank truly, truly tested. But for as long as he has anything left in the tank, he wants to throw. The thing that gives me pause in picking Adesanya here is that of the guys in UFC history that have been described as kind of Matrix-type strikers, he is different from prime Anderson Silva and prime Lyoto Machida in that it's always been possible to hit him. It's always been possible to land on Israel Adesanya, whereas it felt as though Machida and Silva had these long stretches where nobody landed a clean shot on them, even some of the nominally best strikers in the sport. I mean, we just talked about him, but Silva made uh, Rich Franklin look like he'd never drilled Muay Thai before when he thought the clinch was going to be his sweet spot. Uh, that's not Adesanya. Like, people have landed on Adesanya. They've hit him. He destroyed Robert Whittaker. Robert Whittaker landed some shots, just uh, Adesanya would catch him out, out of position afterwards and hit him harder three times. Uh, Gastelum like, actually put some hurt on him for a while. In Costa, we're talking about a guy who, at least as long as his gas tank holds up, throws brutally hard kicks to all levels. You know, he, he, he's going to land some stuff on Adesanya. I don't think he's going to finish him. I could see him having him in more trouble than any of Adesanya's previous opponents have. And that alone is going to make this fight just riveting watching. I think we're going to watch Adesanya have to deal with a type of adversity he has not dealt with before. I am picking him to make it through, make it out the other side. And once he figures out the range and rhythm, once he figures out Costa, uh, once Costa's gas tank starts to fail him, and I count me among those who believe it will, I, I believe uh, Costa's gas tank is going to uh, is going to betray him, and it's going to betray him earlier than we will expect. I, I believe that the momentum will be going one way in pretty obvious fashion by the end of the second round. Give me Adesanya by a late TKO. Say fourth round TKO for Adesanya as Costa is just beat up, swollen, exhausted, still trying to throw back, still trying to throw back hard. He is a proud man. He's got plenty of heart. He fucking hates Adesanya. So there, there's not going to be any quit in him, but I think we're going to find the referee pulling Adesanya off and see some dancing. Keith, take it on home, brother. Man, so, man, I, I love this fight. It was one of these fights that I was already excited when they announced it, and then I did film study, and I like not only do I love this fight, I love both fighters. This I, Saturday night at... Uh, we'll say midnight or technically Sunday morning on the East Coast. Like, it can't come soon enough. I am so excited. And besides the X's and O's, the stylistic matchup, which you know I love to talk about, but there's also those storylines that we have to talk about. We talked about the undefeated. What about the teams and the coaches? Don't forget about that rivalry. Don't forget about, you know, Eugene Berriman was, you know, many different websites, Coach of the Year. Eric Albazin was on record being very upset about that thing he should have had. So you have that rivalry. You know, Eugene Behrman is, you know, it seems like a very humble guy, probably ignoring that. But you know, Coach Eric isn't, uh, you know, he, that he's, he might want this t championship more than Paul Acosta does. Uh, but ultimately what it comes down to is their styles 
you know, if we could categorize them, Israel Adesanya is that sniper who's in the window taking out the enemy one shot at a time, just sniping them. And Barchino is that guy. He's he's the tank who just takes out the whole building. Like he just, you know, that's him. And and I just love it. So I'm gonna start with the champion. And I'm gonna sound like a broken record because a lot of things I said about him in the Yo Yo Yoel Romero fight. I'm gonna say again. So as far as the Yoel Romero fight, he got a lot of you know hate on that because it was not a a exciting fight. He went against maybe the scariest guy on earth, with all due respect to Francis Nagano. But had the easiest route to victory, where I can he's gonna fight at a very slow uh, pace. I just have to wait for his occasional you know attack. And I can just stay out of the range, jab, teep kick, and win. Why wouldn't you take that? Um, but to the skill set of Adesanya, he's probably the best striker in the UFC. He is such a, like, he's a blend of Conor McGregor and Anderson Silva. And what I mean by that, he has a length in the speed of Anderson Silva with the accuracy of Conor McGregor. His hand speed is incredible. Um, as I just said, his accuracy. He says himself, he doesn't pray and hope. He aims and fires. And it's such, like, I love that slogan because it's so true about him. He's a master of distance. He shows no tell signs on his short strikes down the pipe. Um, he set, like, he wait, he's always thinking. You could see that he's thinking and he's setting up traps uh, with his feints. Uh, he feints with his hands, but he also feints with his legs, which, you know, other than maybe. You know, Anderson, so, you know, a few guys, but Anderson was one that he would like kind of faint with the leg to kind of just turn over the hip a little bit to get you thinking about the legs. And he like freezes his opponents with it. Uh, he switches stances. And I love that he switches stances while he comes in and on attack, which gives him different angles in the middle of a combination. But he also switches stances while he's retreating from his opponent. So while his opponent's trying to hit a strike, he's turning to a different stance. So maybe that left hook is no longer there because now. He's he's the south bar, or he's you know something else is not there because of the way he retreats. Um, I I won't spend another like twenty minutes talking about his vision like I did in the all angle show, but his vision is incredible. He sees everything coming to him. He blends his punches and kicks and combinations so well. Like he's so good at ending with a you know kick to the body. Um, he can kick to the leg and kick to the head. Um, he, he, he moves his, his kicks. Like I can move my fingers. It's, uh, you know, his, his hips, it's incredible. Um, I said it last time. I'm going to say it again. He throws this quick question mark kick. He's going to hurt somebody with it because he lands it and he hasn't landed it perfectly clean yet in the UFC. Well, he's going to put someone out with it. Um, he's got you know, great head movement, elusive. I agree with you what you said, uh, um, about, he wasn't Anderson Silva with his head movement, but he does a lot more rolling. While Anderson did a lot of slipping and pulling, he does rolling. So when you do hit him, and you definitely will hit him more, a lot of time it's not a clean shot because it, it, it's more of a grazing shot. But if you do connect, uh, particularly, you know, you said Robert Whitaker, another guy who did connect probably the most was Kelvin Gasolum. Adesanya does not panic when he gets hit or when he, get, or when he gets hurt. And you can tell that is a guy who's been striking at a high level in high level competition, in sparring matches, where he's been in that situation before, and he just goes like, "Yeah, I've been here." Uh, the guy he doesn't get enough credit for his power, and that's because he's not a one Nagano touch you, but he hits you, but where he hits you, and how he hits you, and how he forces you to run into his shots and, and different things is is just so fun to watch. Um, he yeah, you know, he does keep his hands a little low. He didn't like the pressure from Kelvin Gaslam, which which we've already talked about, Costa could be a big thing. But you're not going to land one shot on him. It's got to be the second and the third and the fourth punch you throw on him. If you throw one shot, he's just going to uh, get out of the range. But though he didn't like the pressure against Gaslam, when he faced Whitaker, he already fixed that and he used Whitaker's pressure against him, which is to me was fantastic. Um, he can be backed against the cage, uh, especially in the gasoline. But what I like is he's got to the point where he knows where he's in wrestling, uh, you know, like wrestling range. And then he'll be the one to initiate the clinch first. So then he's at least puts his opponent on the defense first when they're, when they're wrestling, which shows some maturity. Um, I think he's shown some decent takedown defense and he also has that little, uh, he, he likes to do the, where he wraps all the way around to the, either the, the, the you know, wrap around to the far side of the ear and does that pulling trip like you see a lot in like judo. Um, and then we've seen him almost get a submission of it back. Now, Costa, 
man, so the technique and the vision and all this stuff I talked about, Adesanya jumps off the page, but besides the pressure, besides the power, the thing that jumps out to me about Paul Acosta is this guy is absolutely fearless. And what I mean by that is look how he fought Yoro Romero compared to Adesanya. Who goes after Yoel Romero ever? Like, has anybody ever gone after Yoel Romero with nonstop pressure where he's putting himself in that striking zone where Yoel Romero, you know, one of the scariest guys ever? Um, this guy is so powerful. He's huge. I mean, he looks like a heavyweight. Uh, he just walks down his opponents, constant moving pressure. I, I, I can't remember which one you guys said about, like, he, he not only does he pressure you, but he cuts off the cage. He has that huge overhand right that he uses not only to hurt you, but also to get to the range where he'll throw that overhand right and then he'll start digging the body. Um, he, he parries with the left hand a lot, kind of distracts you with the left hand to land the overhand right. Or sometimes he'll parry down and throw this little short hook. And that was the punch that actually caught Romero was a little, he parried to a short hook. Um, and when he gets you to back up to the fence, he will unload the entire arsenal. Um, body, head, body, head. Um, I love that when he hurts you, he'll go down to the body. He doesn't just head hunt. Um, and then his kicks, Ben, you said it with the kicks. Like he doesn't just throw. He like springs into him, and it's it's like to me, like a nightmare would be one day. Like I can't, if I can't wake up and it's just Paulo Costa kicking me. Like I that that seems like terrifying. Um, not much of an offensive wrestler, um, and his takedown defense to me, and which probably won't happen this one. But I always like try try to analyze everything. His takedown defense is confusing because he's been taken down by Alawali Bungboze and Uriah Hall, who not known for the wrestling, but then stuffed takedowns from multi-time national champion Johnny Hendricks and world champion Yoel Romero. Um, he even like did this great uh, hip heist escape against Yoel Romero. Um, the one times he's had the guys hurt and grounded pounds is absolutely brutal. Uh, defensively is where the holes are for him. He likes to do just your like shell, your Tito Ortiz, hide behind the you know the turtling move. You kind of hide, um, and you can't do that with Adesanya. If Adesanya comes with you with a combination, he'll quickly turn an angle where you, now you're not hiding behind that. Um, also, and, and, you know this is going back a long time ago. Alawali Bangbosi actually had some early success in the fight with the leg kicks, um, and Uriah Hall actually landed some clean jobs against him. So um, as a prediction. Uh, I think you guys both hit it on that. Like, Coster is going to pull out a fight out of, out of Sonya. He's going to land some big shots. He's going to be keep moving forward. He's going to back him against the cage. He could land a shot or a couple of shots and put out of Sonya. I do think that's going to happen. But what's I believe what's going to happen, while he's marching forward, I think we're going to see out of Sonya with a higher pace than we've ever seen before because I think he's going to be holding him off with the jab, holding him off with leg kicks, holding him off with teeth kicks. So every time Costa's coming forward, he's getting matched with something. Um I expect, you know, a lot of combination, walk into combinations. I think a lot you're going to see, as uh, I believe what Jay said, cutting angles, like Adesanya be coming. And then while Adesanya rushes in with the combination, we're going to see a quick pivot. You now suddenly Adesanya's on the out, you know, on a quick angle, attacking him, uh, making him miss, making him counter. And I think he finally does this. And over time, as you guys all said, I think Costa will, will Costa's going to have to keep the pressure so high to win because he can't beat Adesanya at a slow pace, but I think ultimately, if he can't get him out early, that's going to backfire on him. That's when Adesanya will snipe him, and I think he's going to snipe him in the fifth round. I think he's going to win by TKO, so I think Adesanya is still the champion come Sunday morning. I apologize for the long one, but I did warn you guys that my main event breakdown was going to be long. There you have it, the Sherdog Radio Roundtable for UFC 253, brought to you by the Sherdog Radio Network and the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network. For a quick rundown of all of the panel's picks, we start off with Kadis Ibragimov versus Danilo Marquez, where Jay and Keith both had Ibragimov by first round knockout. Ben has Marquez by third round submission. In the Juan Espino versus Jeff Hughes fight, all three panelists had Espino. Jay and Ben by first round submission, Keith by decision. Alexa Kamor versus William Knight, all three panelists had Kamor. Keith by third round knockout, Jay by second round knockout, and Ben by decision. Shane Young versus Ludovic Klein. Keith 
and Ben both had Klein by decision, where Jay had Young by decision. Jake Matthews versus Diego Sanchez. All three panelists have Matthews by decision in that one. Brad Riddell versus Alex Da Silva Coelho. All three panelists had Riddell. Jay and Ben have him by decision. Keith by second round knockout or TKO. Moving over to the main card, Zubaira Tukugov versus Hakim Dawudu. Dissension once again. Ben and Keith have Tukugov by decision. Jay Dawudu by decision. Caitlin Vieira versus Sajari Eubanks. All three panelists are picking the Brazilian Vieira by decision. Kai Cara France versus Brandon Royval. All three have Kai Cara France by decision. In the co main event, all three panelists are picking Dominic Reyes to beat Jan Blachowicz and come away with the UFC light heavyweight title. Ben thinks it'll go to decision. Keith has a first round knockout where Jay has it by third round knockout. And in the main event, Israel Adesanya is the unanimous pick of the panel. Jay has the last style bender by decision. Ben by fourth round knockout or TKO. Keith by fifth round knockout or TKO. Thanks and enjoy the fights.